Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to do some studies today. Hello. Welcome, chat. Text chat, voice chats here. Uh, we were just chatting about physical fitness, something that like I, I've been doing a little bit of recently, and so it's been on my mind. And so all of my metaphors recently have been physical fitness related. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just trying to like I'm trying to hype myself up to like not like fuck it up and and drop it. Like it seems like a good thing to keep going. But, um, you know, it's also been like this useful metaphor because, uh, you know, I've been trying to encourage everybody to like follow along and do their own studies and like, um, you know, like learn art and like treat art, like treat art training a little bit more seriously and like have it be kind of a group activity and a little bit of a cultural thing. Like, hey, we all, this is what we all do. We're all like in this, like um, making art, like getting, doing our art pushups and getting better at it together suffering together i don't think it's suffering like i like the pain of exercise and i also like the pain of like art because there's like a there's a mental anguish that comes with like doing art <laughs> you know is, yep it's like one moment you're like oh my god i'm so fucking smart look at how good i am at art and then like you just see it at a different angle or something and you're like i am cannot believe i was ever excited about this i'm so fucking stupid i suck at everything like and it like it rubber bands back and forth in kind of a like wild way sometimes, and I, I've grown really accustomed to that over the years, and so it doesn't really like I experience it, but it doesn't like affect me deeply. Like I don't ruminate on it when I'm not working, and I also don't like um, you know I it, it doesn't I don't like get stuck like just thinking about it or like have it affect my choices. Like I just acknowledge that that's what I'm feeling and I'm just like do something else okay all right that's good um yeah I kind of I think I'm kind of the same way um although maybe not as like far along I, I remember when I was like starting out I used to like take long breaks from drawing if I got like stuck on a painting like I would take it as evidence that I like didn't have what it takes or whatever I'd like to <laughs> <drop> for a <laughs> while and come back to it do you have what it takes to be a professional artist can you draw the parrot? The oh, that, parrot I guess that, that is an outdated, that is a fucking mega outdated reference. I don't think anybody's been asked to draw the parrot or the pirate in a long ass time. Yeah, I don't get it. What's this a reference to? Oh, okay. Like back in the day, I mean, maybe, maybe like Dustin can find, yeah. Let's hear your Macho Man impersonation. No, 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 no. I was sharing a video of Isis Macho Man. I don't think that's for stream. Um, the there's like back in the day there was like this there was this commercial that would happen on daytime television for like a mail in art school I think it was and in order to like test your aptitude they asked you to draw a like a pirate and a and like a turtle I think it was what I got never mind I gotta look this up let's see art test Pirate. And what was funny is I actually, yeah, yeah, a pirate and a turtle. Here it is. Um, I had to, I went to like a art, I went to like a interview and they had me do this. It was like the test was like they would give you the, these two figures and you had to try to reproduce them as best as you could. And so, like, I guess it was some combination. There's some combination of features in here that theoretically a trained eye can figure out what things you're good at and what things you're bad at based off of what parts about it you get right or wrong. So this is uh, like, this was like the iconic art test when I was growing up was draw the pirate and the turtle. You have to draw that pirate and that turtle, or did you make this it exact turtle? pirate and this exact turtle? Like you just had to copy this. You had to do a like a study of this. You would do a drawing, and then you would mail it away. <laughs> what? I feel like you could, you could trace that, Jake. You could trace it. I mean, I guess you could trace it, yeah. But I mean, I could. You could probably see if someone's tracing it. Over five thousand dollars in prizes awarded monthly. What the fuck? Where does this mouse coming from? But yeah, like art instructional schools, like here, like draw this shit, fill out your stuff and then like send it away. You may win one of the five 
$995 art scholarships or any of the 75 ten dollar cash prizes <laughs> okay <laughs> uh that, that would be funny if we did like draw the turtle and potentially win a ten dollar cash prize and i was just like venmoing people ten dollars for drawing this fucking turtle <laughs> that would be kind of funny as a gag i don't know i don't think it's a, th a good idea um but yeah that's that this is like to me this is what an art test looks like that was like my understanding of it as a child. I, I think I got the tail end of it because we're talking about mid eighties. This was okay. on TV. So you have to be decently old. Like I think Ash would probably recognize the art and the other uh, pirate and the turtle. Dustin probably recognizes the pirate and the turtle. As a British person, this perplexes me. Yeah, I don't think, the, I don't think the British got this. I think this was an American daytime television phenomenon. Yeah. You're watching cartoons, and then a commercial would come up for whatever this is, the Art Instruction Schools. It was so generically named, I don't even remember what it was called. And they would ask you to draw this shit and mail it in. Tony Hart and Neil Buchanan. Wait, wait, wait. When I was searching this, when I searched this up, I thought I saw a name, Heather Namath Bren. Yeah, different. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess people people remember this. I'm not the only person in the world who saw this. This isn't like a private memory of mine. Reminds me of the show Franklin. The art commercial would come up alongside um, Golf Mill Ford and Victory Auto Records <laughs> watching Maury or something. Yeah, exactly. Or um, uh, Eagle... Probably Eagle, like uh, auto insurance, and uh, 1 800 Empire, which I think was not actually a local thing. I think that the 1 800 Empire thing was actually a national chain. I heard of where I'm from, too. Yeah. feel like something was lost with tv we don't get as much weird random janky stuff advertised at us anymore um yeah i mean whatever we just get no i we got ty lopez instead like we gave up on 1-800 empire and we got um knowledge instead which mm -hmm. i don't mind i kind of love i was thinking like in the future it would be funny like if was if we get to the point where we have to do like uh like if we start to try to make like a youtube ad for um, Huckleberry, I really want to like recreate the Ty iconic Ty Lopez commercial. <laughs> <laughs> like where like it's like Huckleberry. Sorry, go ahead. But like, yeah, that, wouldn't that be funny if it's just like me in a garage somewhere, like basically just repeating the fucking weird, awkward script from that Ty Lopez ad, but have it be for <laughs> yeah. Huckleberry instead? I think that'd be funny. I like how Huckleberry Art Academy is just gradually turning into a vehicle for Pete to, like, dress up as things and do bits. <laughs> yes. But it's like, Angelarium's not good for me doing bits. Like, nobody on Angelarium ever wants a bit from me. Ever, ever, ever. It's like, it's the brand is so serious. But, like, Huckleberry seems like the bits are not wholly unappreciated. So... Time to dress up as Macho Man Randy Savage. Uh, yeah, this is finally there's an opportunity for me to hire that wrestler to pretend to be me. <laughs> that, that I mean, that Maybe would also be a pretty good. Out. That would also be a pretty good ad if I hired a wrestler to record a wrestling promo for Huckleberry Art Academy. Yeah. Certainly not. So continue. the rumors that Neil Buchanan is Banksy and started on Twitter by me years before it hit the gossip rags. He had to come out and deny it. The guilt of making my childhood art hero mad, a guilt I carry with me forever. Damn, Kim, you fucking you're in the you're in the Matrix code. Instead of a Lambo, it's ha you have a bicycle. No, I I would. 
I think I could if it was a if we were committed to the bit like we would have number one I don't have a garage so I'd have to film it probably in Sean's garage <laughs> um, oh by the way uh, Sean Murray might actually come by and guest judge this week's challenge I gotta make an announcement about that on the server but I was uh, I was having coffee with him this morning I was telling him about all of the fun stuff we're doing and he he logged onto the server and uh, I was telling him yeah you should stop by and he's like when I was like, yeah, Friday, Friday noon. He's like, I got nothing going on. I'll come join you. And Sean's oh, a fucking damn. legend. He's a perfect fit for like guest judging this thing. Is that this Friday or next Friday? This Friday. Oh, okay. So he's gonna help I'm me pick good, like... who gets a banana sticker this week. Oh, how about that? He he gets like brought up all the time. This Discord people keep mentioning his art. Uh, yeah, I mean Jake is a huge fan of his, um, and like. He's one of my closest friends. He lives down the street. I biked over to his house this morning to go eat, to, to go drink coffee and like pet his cat. Oh, okay. So cute. I mean, he is a really cute cat. Like, uh, very, one of the friendliest cats I've ever hung out with. But uh, yeah, I'm trying this method of like I don't really care about the values here. I just want to get like the general block of like different areas of the figure. And uh, so I'm just kind of like picking a shape and instead of drawing a circle around it, I'm just drawing the lasso around it and then filling it. And um, eventually I should end up with like a complete silhouette and like a certain amount of sort of segmentation I can use as like a guideline. But uh, the problem I'm trying to address with this is like, Last week, not last week, yesterday, when I was uh, doing a study, I was like kind of just trying out going back to my old habits and seeing how it went. And it was more or less fine. But I also felt like when I'm not being careful about the way that I'm building the image, uh, I end up with a lot of really rough marks that I feel like don't serve me later. And so I'm just like spending a lot of time early on. This is true in my mainline paintings too. Spending a lot of time making rough marks that just like are really time consuming and then I need to go back and clean up later and it all turns into like a big like uh, it turns into like more repetition more like just repeated work than I really care for. And so using the lasso tool gets me something that's a little bit tighter just because all the edges are tight from the beginning by default um, potentially gives me like this little added bonus of like um, tighter kind of marks to begin with. I've seen some um, some people do really really impressive things by basically just painting with the lasso tool and like a soft brush. Yeah. Like produce like very like finished looking paintings very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't think I'm necessarily I'm not necessarily trying to do that. But I'm I am interested in kind of experimenting with like the loose blocking, just like using the lasso tool as kind of my primary mark making tool here. Certainly it feels different to use. Yeah, I uh Yeah, it's a bit I don't know. I've like I've gone through phases where I was like, okay, the secret to being good at painting lasso. is to just use the lasso tool. And then I use it and it's like, oh fuck, how come like when other people make stuff with it, it's cool. And when I make it, it's like... Yeah. It's like wobbly edges to things because my hand's not, like, steady enough. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't have a particular like... steady hand and and everything, so it's like I'm kind of... It's not that everything's not wobbly. It's that it's, it's at least... Cr it's wobbly, but it's all crisp. Um, I am finding, though, I'm getting more comfortable with, like, using the lasso, just, like, the more that I draw, like, the more mileage I build up and the better my, like, hand-eye coordination. I'm, like, less intimidated by it. Mm hmm Yeah, I'm also feeling a little less intimidated by it because I, I put it on, like, a hotkey on the button on my, um, ever since I put it on the button on my, uh, my stylus, I, like, definitely use it way more. Oh, Okay. So I put it on like the forward end of the rocker on the button. Just the, it it just, um, I can just demonstrate here instead of talking about it. So uh, on the pen, 
you see you've got the two buttons here. The back one is right click, which pulls up the the bit the brush context menu if I click on the canvas. And then the right. forward one just goes to keyboard, keystroke, and it's just the letter L, which is it, by default the lasso tool. So if you press and hold it, and then you do something, and then you let go, the Photoshop has this thing called, um, I think it's either sticky keys or magnetic keys, where like if you switch, press the tool, it'll switch to it, and then you do something and you let go. Like if you hold it down while you're using it, like this is R for the rotate tool, and then you let go and it immediately snaps back. So instead of having to be like B, like R to go to rotate, B to go back into my brush, you can just press and hold R and do it and then let go and it'll go back automatically. So the same thing's true with the lasso tool. So if you hit L and hold L, you get lasso and then you let go and you're back on brush again. Okay. Um, but uh, let's see, I need to go to R and reset view, there we go. Uh, so I've done that with, uh, so because I have the L key on here, then I like click and hold, and then when I let go, it immediately goes back to brush, and I can do this. So it's just like I have this one button push to make a lasso thing, and it automatically snaps back to my brush tool. Hello, Artist Mac. Nice to see you here. Playing eternal cleanup on my own paintings is the story of my life. Hey, Adam. Uh, yeah, it's like, I, 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 I don't mind playing the cleanup game where I go through and I scrub over everything. Like, I feel like I've gotten really good at kind of doing that quickly if I know where I'm headed with it all. But, uh, the issue I'm kind of running into is that like, um, it, like, it's just not necessary. I like, I'm just making more work for myself in a lot of cases than is totally necessary. It's hard though figuring out a way to like make your drawings look good and like <laughs> make you know at every phase yeah yeah it's hard to make your drawings i don't look know good. yeah it's just, like i see i don't know i see all these like anime artists on twitter who have like really really nice looking sketches and i'm just like fuck how are they doing this um i don't know they probably all think they look like shit and also they're like you know, <laughs> there was this habit, there was this like thing for a while, this sort of cultural thing for a while, where everyone was like, oh yeah, 20 minutes, no ref. It was like, everyone was just trying to be cool about how little time they spent on stuff and how casual it was. Like, I think there was, I was looking around, I was hanging around on voice chat on some other server and I was looking around on Pinterest and I found like uh, this like incredibly beautiful study somebody had done. Uh -huh. And like the name of the piece was just like quick doodle. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh fuck you, man. <laughs> like, oh god. There's like, there is so much of that out there of like somebody just sweating it out like really hard, and then like playing it off like, yeah, you know, it's just casual or whatever. I did so I don't believe it. Like when people like play at this idea that like oh it was so easy yeah just casual just like a quick sketch just a quick doodle like i just imagine them like just full-on flop sweat like existential crisis because i know that's like when i'm actually talking to people i know that's like their experience most of the time working on art even like a really good artist like they have they go through it they're always going through it artists are always going through it there's not a lot of ways to get out of it okay um there's uh speaking of the um like finished painting that they say like oh random doodle you guys there's this uh artist i'm like uh i like retweet their stuff sometimes on like twitter um and like they do this every single thing they post they're like just a doodle you guys and it's like a painted illustration with seven characters and yeah. dynamic poses <laughs> in it. <laughs> i'm not even saying that as like a, a like a made-up thing to make it funnier they actually posted that and they were like just doodle you guys yeah is it like a cope is it like oh yeah like if it if you don't like it it's because i didn't do a lot of work on it but like or is it like you think it's more of like a, them trying to like look like they are um i uh i called them out on it and their response was like if i didn't put a ton of planning into it it's a doodle oh i guess whatever um, so. 
I'm sure they love getting called out in public space. Oh, um, I didn't even think of it that way. <laughs> say called out. I don't know. I, I, I said it in a very, like, complimenting way. Like, I was like, damn, dude, doodle, really? This is kind of good. <laughs> like, my doodles never turn out this good. <laughs> but I think they were okay with it. I turned it into a compliment. I'll take your word for it. I don't know. I, I always, I'm, I'm terrible at reading those kinds of situations. I feel like I've, I've put my foot in my mouth on that one before. Oh, okay. The trick is you just put hearts on everything, so you can be. I, I feel <laughs> like that, like you know how when you're talking to a cat, like the only thing it understands is your like tone of voice. Right. My approach to like communicating with people through text on the internet is it's like. Okay, I have to make it very obvious that my tone is friendly. So every sentence gets an exclamation point on the end of it. And if there's an opportunity to put, like, hearts and smiley face emojis, like, they're going on there. No matter what I'm saying. Even if I'm telling them that, like, I don't know. Uh, they're catty. Hey, you're you're lying. Your line sack of shit. This is not even close to a doodle. There's seven characters in here. Love you. Heart. Bye-bye. Love you. Heart. Happy face. <laughs> Pretty much. I don't know. That's my method. I don't know if it works. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking... Okay, so I've got, like, a lot of this block out kind of blocked out. I wonder if maybe I should just, oh, like, decide to live with whatever, like, uh, choices I've made here and be like, that's the drawing, everyone. I don't feel like the perspective is super jacked. Like, I don't, like, trying to sell, part of the challenge of this one is, like, trying to sell the perspective of it. Um, and I don't feel openly ashamed of my, the sense of perspective on this, at least yet. Maybe there's something about it I'm missing. Looks perspective-y. Perspective-y, sure, okay. Oh man, the stuff you were telling me about um, the other night has like caused a series of epiphanies. Really? Um, yeah, I was looking through old art to um, to repost, and you know how you were telling me about like just being like more minimalistic about stuff and like letting the like hatching and stuff I was doing show through in the drawing. Yeah. I found one of my like old drawings that I was like really I I did it like last year that I was like really really not happy with but like DeviantArt liked it for whatever reason uh -huh. so I was like Did you finally see what I... everybody else saw in it? Um yeah, and the thing is what what happened was like I turned off one layer I was like, what the fuck? Why did I ruin this at the last second? This looks way better. Huh. This one layer turned off. Interesting. Um, yeah, and what it, what the layer was was just like a multiply layer with like a darkish value where I like tried to pet in some like just like darker core shadows mostly. Um, I was making everything muddy and it was like making all the like hatching line work stuff disappear. Hmm. So, like the second I turned that off, it's like wait this just got like 10 times better interesting how did i not like see this before but it's in line with what you were telling me um and the other thing too was like i i did the thing where like i made sure there's like a gradient where like there's more light hitting the head and like less light hitting the feet <laughs> yeah it's it's not that complicated like you know, okay, so let's uh, let's let's discuss this right now because we have a visual example here that we can bring on. Um, you forgot to tag yourself when you posted your recent painting. I hope you didn't think Huckleberry Art was reposting art without credit. Uh, okay, yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I gotta tag myself better when I'm like reposting stuff on Huckleberry. Um, okay, so we were having this conversation, and I was like, oh, uh, painting, making something look painted is easy. You just have to add a gradient. And um, this is actually a pretty bad example as to give as a photograph, uh, to give as a, like a photographic example of it because the lighting is so even. Like we have this like figure here where it's like, it, there's bright light kind of emanating from everywhere. So we've got a lot of ambient occlusion and not a lot of like um, key lighting. 
but we can kind of imagine. So I'm gonna like fake it in a little bit here. Like the basic idea is like, if you are, uh, I'm just gonna do this. If you are wanting to give something make it feel more rendered, uh, it comes down to like a gradient. And like, that means like, okay, we're gonna put a little bit of light up here and we're gonna put a little darkness down here. And this um, pushing the, like sometimes I'll just do this as like an overlay or a soft light or hard light. But like, you can see that like um, over the length of the socks here, it's kind of gradating as it goes up the length of the leg from darker to lighter. There's like these kind of intersecting gradients that happen when you're when you're looking at rendering. Where like there's the gradient that runs uh, this way, like up the leg, but then there's like another one that kind of wraps around the leg. So like we just need to think about like, okay, well it's gonna be lighter on top and like darker on the bottom. So we can do something that's like maybe just a soft brush stroke, or maybe like literally a gradient depending on how much we have blocked in, and like it's really not about trying to meticulously push everything around it, you can sometimes just like get this effect by like um laying in like a literal gradient that runs across the whole length of the figure but like what i'm doing when i'm thinking about lighting most of the time is i'm thinking about like you know these sort of larger longer gradients that run across the whole form so like it's going to be a lot lighter up towards the head and a lot darker down towards the feet. And that's going to give a sense of like spotlighting. And you can see it's like already happening, even though I haven't done any kind of real detail, but then you also get like these smaller segmentations. Like you see like across the face, like if we think about moving across the face from like left to right here, I'm trying to get a brush that's actually going to show up. There we go. Left to right across this way. We can assume, okay, well, there's light coming in from the left side. So then we can just kind of like transition slowly lighting from left to right. And we get like to round out the face a little bit. Same thing across the neck, you know, it's going from sort of left to right. And if we rough that in, we have kind of a rough structure for a, you know, a, tran a transition from left to right. And like, you know, when you start looking around for like simple transitions of where does it go from light to dark and then back dark to dark to light or whatever, you can see it here, like in the hair, it's darker in the bottom left corner. And then as it kind of moves up into the right over here, it lightens as it gets towards the highlight. And then we get this again across the top of the head. It's like dark over here, dark over here. And then it kind of, you know, it, there's this softer gradient as like, you know, we get the darker parts here and then it's kind of lighter towards the middle and like, that's that's rendering <laughs> it like isn't it, it there's a if you have like a million little gradients that kind of all overlap each other you can end up with something that like looks rendered in the end but like a lot of what i'm looking for is like hey look at this crease that's going up here inside the sweater it's like darker as it's down towards the tip and it gets lighter as it gets up there so i'm not really focused on like what is the exact value everywhere along this whole chain I'm more worried about like, as I go to add in this crease, I could maybe say start off at 100%, do the whole crease all black, and then say, well, and then I'm gonna slowly sort of push it down across the length of it here. And now as we get this gradient, now that's like a crease that's been like rendered. And so like a lot of, that's like what's happening in a lot of situations is that there's like, either a subtle gradient, like you can see like uh, the ambient inclusion shadow is basically just a gradient where it's like dark as it hits this edge and then it goes and then it kind of washes away and gets lighter. So we can go and lasso this off. And then with just black, <laughs> go and hit this edge here. And there we go, you know, lighting. It's it, if you look around through a painting, you will often find that there are these kind of subtle gradients that are constantly happening everywhere. You'll notice like there's like obvious little ones like, hey, these little ambient occlusion shadows where like the the elbow meets the uh, the sweater here, easy to spot. But if you sort of zoom out, you might see like, uh, oh, it's like a little bit lighter generally as it gets down here and then it darkens a little bit as like the form turns upwards. 
And so like you can, you know, brush that in really softly at a distance to get a little bit of sense of the thing turning over length. And you can see like, it's a little bit lighter down here, a little bit darker up here. And that's how like we were sort of roughing in lighting. And if you are looking for it, you will spot it fucking everywhere. It's like, there are always these like changes over a distance in the lighting, like change it over the length from like head to toe, you know, from top to bottom, you know, around any given form, left to right, up and down. And like, if you're looking for those, you will be spotting them everywhere. And then if you're like, oh, my thing looks a little flat. The question isn't like, how do I add more detail? The question is like, how do I make transitions that sort of slowly go over the length of the figure? Like let's pick, pick any large thing in the scene and like make a transition that happens over like a long distance. Even big flat objects, look at this. You can see this big flat piece of green back here is basically got this like shadow that is like this soft shadow here. And then there's a little bit of cast shadow here but it's like these big soft shapes, these big soft transitions that happen over the long length of this, you would end up with a really weird flat kind of graphic look if you were to completely flatten it out. But if you wanna give it the sense of more 3D-ness, 3D-ness is often just like a subtle transition over a long space. So it really is just like, you know, you there there's, I can do it here digitally very easily by washing in like a really soft, like a single brush stroke with a soft um, brush. But like an artist who's working traditionally won't necessarily be able to do like a big soft wash like this. Oh, it's on the wrong layer. So you're not necessarily like, when I'm starting off like blocking in a value pattern, I'm sometimes just doing these to like kind of kick off like, hey, is it generally going from darker to lighter as we get over here and then like lighter to darker as we, you know, what do are, what are these like big transitions look like broadly if we were to just turn them into like a couple of soft brush strokes? But like I, what I'll see sometimes is like there's some, an artist like Eric Fortune who will do this and he'll do it with, uh, he'll do it with like acrylic or ink on paper and he has to do it by like very, let me pull up an example of his work. I love Eric Fortune's work. He's doing it in like the most manual, most painful way possible, which is always like uh, crazy to see. Like you can see these like soft, subtle gradients in his figures here. This is being done by like, he's not able to do this in a big wash. This is like, acrylic on paper, I think. Acrylic washes on canvas. And so he's like mixing slightly different colors. Like he's mixing like a slightly like darker color every centimeter that he goes like up and down these areas. Like these soft transitions here, these are all like him mixing slightly different colors and like progressively watering down or like mixing a different color in across these like long lengths. Um, the same is true of some, if you see anybody that does like really, really precise graphite rendering, it's like you can, there are like graphite powder techniques you can use to create gradients more quickly, but I've known plenty of artists that will create these like long subtle gradients by like very carefully modulating like the way that they do shading over like huge distances. So like noticing it is like the first step, but then there's this process of like creating it using your tools can be either a very automatic and quick thing if you're doing like, like if you're working with airbrush or you're working digitally, like you can just use a digital airbrush and it's easy to make like gradients like super, super simply. But like you can also do it like the insane way and like do it with a mechanical pencil, one grain at a time. Um, one of my very first students ever, somebody named Rebecca Yanovskaya, Oh yeah, her stuff's crazy. Um, Nuts, that's done with just like a ballpoint pen. Yeah, and so she does these, she does the same thing, but she does it with entirely with ballpoint pen. Oh, she's like, this is like a piece that she did with me like a decade ago, still, still hanging out, still making money. But so she's doing these kinds of like soft, long transitions entirely using like 
ballpoint pen, one little scrape of like one little turn of the ball bearing at a time, uh, slightly modulated pressure to create these like longer transitions, uh, which is completely fucking crazy. It's not the way that people do things because it's the insanely hard way to do things. Uh, but working, doing digital studies or whatever, we can make this stuff happen really quickly. Or if you've got a really clean drawing, uh, like Neil, like you do, you can go and like throw in some sort of loose brush strokes digitally to create a kind of digital watercolor that allows you to create these kinds of like soft transitions over long lengths of space really easily. Um, and it's it's a pretty fast process. And like if you can if you can do those kind of long transitions mixed with like these kind of smaller notes of like you know we can see like um over like look at i'm looking at this leg here it's hard to make notes with a big brush um looking looking along this axis of the leg here you can see that it like it's brighter up here towards the kneecap and then it's like slowly kind of transitioning here. It does a little bit of a sharper turn as we turn around the form there. But like if we wanted to, so like if we were, we're looking to like recreate the lighting here, it really is just a matter of like looking at the transitions. We've got this kind of turning of form that's happening across the top of the knee, like around here. So there's this kind of axis around this way and then as it dives down, you know, we're like get this very, very soft transition. So what I'll do sometimes is I'll be grabbing a darker color and I'll just be sort of mushing it up one step at a time and like maybe going taking a lighter color and then mushing it downwards from that center. And like you can do that even with a hard edge brush if you have if you like turn the flow down the way that I do. And it's really just a matter of like thinking about that transition over the length, over a longer length. It sometimes can be kind of subtle. So I think that people don't notice when I'm doing it because like, it's like not a huge transition of value from up here to down here. And so I'm not like, I, I sometimes, because I think about art this way, I sometimes struggle with um, cell shading because cell shading is all about like finding like, where's the exact cutoff point where a shadow, it stops being a highlight and starts becoming a shadow. But really I'm often looking for these larger zones of value like here and trying to notice like subtle transitions over the length of them like oh underneath the leg we have this like ambient occlusion shadow and then it's kind of like still remaining sort of dark and then it's lightening up and then it's darkening again as it kind of comes closer to the under part of the skirt and so it's a i'm i'm like considering this like transition over the length of the leg as the way in which i'm creating the lighting which is like obviously not possible. If like you were to do this as cell shaded, you would probably just like take this one cast shadow here with this sort of ambient occlusion and like just pin that off as a shadow and everything else would just be a different color. But like um, I've never been able to figure out how to get it to look quite right under those circumstances. I always feel like I, I wanna have those like more subtle transitions in order to make it feel right. But the, uh, the advantage of working with the lasso tool is that like you can make uh, like a hard edge where like that, you know, you can kind of cordon off like that little piece of where you want um, the, the color to go. Like what is the segment of the uh, painting that you're working on? And then you can like inside that space work on some more subtle transitions and then you end up with this mixture of soft edges and hard edges like really, really quickly. And like that is uh, something I've not done a lot of over the years. Like I've gone through and tried to manually cut or soften every single edge by just using the brush tool um, and just try to be careful about where I'm putting stuff, but I'm not actually that careful and I'm not that coordinated. So I tend to have a lot of accidental marks that make a lot of like uh, accidental mush all over the place. And I spend all my time cleaning it up later. Um, but like, if I can build a habit for using the lasso tool, then I can theoretically start to be able to handle some of that stuff more quickly with like less mess. And then I'm able to like build in these uh, 
building these like smaller transitions without having to like worry about it overlapping into other edges and stuff. Like you can see the way it pops out of the knee here. You know, the w with the lasso tool, you can really easily carve it up, but like without using the lasso tool, the way I've typically done it is by like turning the brush up to uh, 100 percent opacity and then manually trying to carve the edge by just uh, running the brush lengthwise across where that edge needs to be, which means that I don't need to like switch tools or like think I can just like watch television while I'm working. Oh, I think my window is frozen. That's awesome. Study number 61. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, um, I haven't actually integrated using the lasso tool into my mainline painting much uh, at all yet. And like, not even for like selections and stuff. No, nah, not really. I I really feel like I should. The more I've like kind of gotten used to it here during the studies, the more I'm thinking like, oh, this is just becoming natural. I should just be doing this. Like that's kind of the reason why I'm so stoked on these studies is because. Like I've been wanting to like learn some of these like working methods for a long time or just like build habits for them. And um, I've done so many paintings a very particular way that like I just don't think about those habits when I'm in the middle of working. Yeah, that's super true. You get like a way of doing things. You don't want to like screw it up when you're doing like a mainline thing. And so you're like... also just like just used to doing things a certain way. I mean, it's just automatic. Yeah. So I um, I've been using these these as a, a test bed for making sure that I don't uh, that I'm able to like actually do the, like experiments that I mean to do because like the stakes are so much lower. If I really fuck it up or if it's a terrible idea, you know, I'll it, fine. I'm free in a couple hours, and I'll I'll never look back, and it's gonna be just fine. But if I try it out and it's great and I keep repeating it and I build a habit for it, then I'm gonna have access to that like later when I go to like work on mainline stuff. So it's like theoretically going to be building habits that are gonna make my paintings better or faster or something good. Um. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I've been trying to like get better at painting through studies, mm -hmm. but what ends up happening is I spend the entire time on the drawing. <laughs> and, like, yeah, I mean, um, that's one of the reasons I've been trying to like start pieces in different ways, like start the drawing process in different ways as I've been doing these. Like, yeah, you can give that a try. Yeah, I, I've I've also experimented with that, but it's like produced some of the worst art I've made in here. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't um, give it a couple of reps. I'd say give it a couple of reps before you throw it in the trash. Yeah, yeah, maybe I just need to like try it again. Try working with shapes instead of like drawing. Um, it's really funny though. There's like a phase in those like um, speed paintings I was doing like every day, uh -huh. um, where I decide like, man, I never get to the painting. I'm just going to jump straight into like a bunch of value block ins, and it's going to make me do better work faster. It had the exact opposite effect. <laughs> it made me do very bad work very slow. But maybe I just wasn't used to it. I I gave it like, I don't know, like eight or nine tries. Plus, I was doing some studies. Eight or nine tries is a pretty good shake. Yeah, it just didn't seem like it was getting any better. And then the second, I was like, but like, like you've seen that like folder. There's like a moment where like suddenly I'm doing way better, and it was like the moment I decided to just like let myself spend all the time on the drawing and do like really minimalistic painting underneath. Mm -hmm. And it just like instantly made everything look ten times better. And it made everything less stressful, too. That's the idea. 
the two typically align. Like you typically get better quality work when you are also putting in lower effort work, I find. Yeah. Like um, being really picky about putting in higher effort often leads to like um, overworking shit and like ending up like putting forward time into things that in bad faith. Yeah, that's actually the other epiphany I was like, um, kind of having. I've 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 been having like various like different versions of this epiphany that like, I think part of um what's screwing up my paintings is actually like, doing too much sometimes when it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, in some cases it's just I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but there's definitely like other cases where it's like. Like, like it happens to me with like bounce light a lot is I'll like pick a bounce light color and I'll be like it's not rendered enough that's the problem and I'll like pick at it and the color will turn muddy because muddy of the way like I don't know like blending like a cool color together with like a warm color kind of works and I just like lose what I was like going for and it's actually not because like I'm there's just some secret thing I don't know it's just like I'm doing too much. Like I should just do some like confident brush strokes and then like leave it. Sometimes. I mean sometimes it you do want to pick at it. It's all a bit conditional. Yeah. Um all right. But yeah, man. Um I'm going to I've been avoiding the face. I'm going to maybe block in the face a little bit here and then um the other thing I realized too is um, this uh, artist who's like thing I'm studying right now. Mm -hmm. um, he has process videos, um, and uh, looking at his process, he actually barely paints. It's all just a ton of drawing with this like hatching going on, and then he like puts in some like gradients or whatever. Yeah, all's good, and it kind of works. I don't think everybody does that, but. I mean, that's the thing, uh, is everybody kind of works differently. Everybody works in a way that, like, makes sense to them. Like, the whole point of process is that... Oh, wait. What is my resolution here? Am I fucking myself on the resolution? No, oh, it's the same one. I guess it's just a small head. Um, everyone's going to work in a way that makes sense to them, like, mentally. And like, I think everyone, can, I think everyone like um, encodes and decodes artistic information differently or like visual information differently. So like if you, I think people literally see the world differently and like encode and decode stuff differently. And so like their process is really just a reflection of like the way that they see, the way that their brain like processes the visual information. And, um, and like, you know that you're if you're going to be doing it differently than somebody else that means you need to like break apart the steps that you do on your own work process differently than other people um and you're not going to know what that is for you without some level of like experimentation so it's important that you like try out like look at a lot of tutorials and try out a lot of different work methods and see which of them like when you try it it just makes sense it just clicks and then anything else that like doesn't click and doesn't make sense, you can just forget about it. Like, just be like, oh, that's really interesting. That's cool to know that that works there. Like, maybe you'll meet somebody who that'll be useful to them. And that's really all there is to it. You just don't sweat it. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, Ash was like telling me the same thing too that like, I'm overdoing it with the values under the line art mm -hmm. in my pieces. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe she was on to something. Uh, she's pretty smart. <laughs> yeah. Kind of good at painting. Good at, good at art, for sure. Banana, banana, def, if she didn't already have a big brain, she'd get a banana sticker. So that did, it, did I announce that on the stream yesterday? We, uh, we have officially, I've made it, so I made a choice. We were talking about this on stream yesterday about like, what are people going to get for winning challenges, weekly challenges? Winning being like, not exactly the appropriate term. 
But like we have these weekly challenges. This week's challenge is our uh, fan oh, pff, fairy tale with a twist, where you can sort of take a myth or legend or a fairy tale and like put a twist on it that gives allows you to have fun with it and put your own personal spin on it. Uh, Sean Murray is going to be looking at the entries with us on Friday. It, it looks like Sean Andrew Murray, the creator of Gateway, guy who does weird sort of whimsical weird fantasy stuff all the time he's like uh worked with Guillermo del Toro he's done a lot of stuff in games he's currently a professor over at Ringling and then um we're gonna pick every Friday I think we're gonna pick three people from the challenges uh like from like various places from like people who did the challenges in a way that we really like or people have been really helpful around the discord or like inside the resources section or in the crit section or something and we're going to hand up every week three banana stickers you get a roll as you're good at art and it's got a banana sticker and you have a banana sticker next to your name so that's going to be the prize there's no uh benefits imparted to owners of banana stickers but um you do get that little sticker next to your name and your name can also be yellow then and it's pretty cool. I don't know. So uh, I am excited to start handing these things out because they're silly. And um, but also like, hey, if you're hanging around Huckleberry a lot, like what you would I think you should want to have a banana sticker. It's proof. It's like social proof. Anybody who comes in is going to see you and they're going to go, how do you get one of those? And you're going to be like, oh, I'm sorry. These are only for people who are good at art. <laughs> Who's, who's the artist you're bringing on? Sean Andrew Murray. Yeah, let me just pull up his stuff. My neighbor. <laughs> Sean Andrew Murray, concept artist. Uh, let's see. Who's this gate? Cityofgateway.com. He does like all this in pencil mostly. His pencil drawings are kind of crazy. Wizards and non wizards. <laughs> That's how those sorted out. But uh, yeah, he's uh, he's an incredible concept artist, and he also is an incre uh, incredible with pencil, and he does a lot of writing and stuff. And uh, it's uh, he does like really intense levels of detail and like adds a lot of weird interesting details into everything he draws and he also tends to draw these really epic cityscapes these sort of like antique cityscapes that just sort of stretch off forever and there's like weird giant winding cities and he does this all in pencil and then he does like uh some sort of loose i would say almost like a ink or watercolor or like watered down acrylic kind of um, shading digitally it's not a lot of digital painting it's mostly all there in the pencils um, and he's he's a his sketchbooks are crazy damn it's always cool when this is all just like a very very small sliver because he's always producing tons and tons and tons of sketchbook pages and like giant, giant drawings. And he's also a hell of an educator too. He just joined the Discord this morning. So he might be hanging around here and there. I the one of the habits that I've learned while doing these studies that I'm going to stick with is like blocking in the shading of the face before the features has been such a game changer for me because it gives me a sense on where the features are supposed to go in the face much more clearly than just looking at the external sort of silhouette of the head. And, oh yeah. And then 
because I always feel like I'm trying to figure out where do the features go in the silhouette of the head. And I'm like, how do people figure out where the stuff is? There's no landmarks. So then trying to like do like a simple volume blocking for the head, like helps solve that problem. And then also makes it so I have rough rendering done. I don't have to try to do rough rendering while moving around the features. I do the rough rendering first and then I cut the features in on top of it and it, it totally saves my ass. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the, I mean, for one, just like, I don't know, like adding in some, like basically drawing in some features over top of like a rough block in seems really efficient. Um, but like, oh God, I, I, so I used to do like, um, like Magic the Gathering style, like fantasy art before uh -huh. I like swapped over to anime and like, the hardest part of making that transition was drawing heads where there where you don't have like the you know like like you don't like shade in a brow ridge fully when you're drawing like an anime head or whatever so it's yeah. really easy to lose track of like where the eyes are supposed to be positioned and where the side plane of the head yeah begins. like a and lot it, of anime just bullshits it in a way like even really good anime drawings sometimes if you try to model them in 3d are like unmodelable because the the whole face is kind of like exaggerated and where the facial features that wind up yep yeah and it's just like i don't know i had i have just like pages and pages of like derpy anime heads from when i got into it like the bodies would be okay and then just the worst anime heads <laughs> it took forever to be able to do it i st i'm still a little inconsistent with it yeah it's something i struggle with is figuring out like exactly where do all the features like fit inside the head can can be a bit of a challenge and yeah, i but i've but been just, finding that this like doing a rougher block in on it earlier has been really helpful yeah that makes a huge amount of sense to me having that like shadow of the brow ridge and the separation between like the front plane of the cheek and the side plane like goes a long way to being able to draw a good head quickly This isn't a particularly good head. Kids. I'm like bragging about this at the same time as I'm like kind of painting it bad. <laughs> 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 I'm just, it's less painful. Like I think there's probably fewer corrections that need to be made to like get it in place. Let me like look at this more generally. Zooming out and looking at it more gen generally is like the habit I was always avoiding, I think. Like recently? Mm, like forever. Uh, okay. Like I, I just know like for as long as I've been making art, like the temptation is always to want to get it and get specific whenever something feels wrong. Instead of like zooming okay. out and looking at it more generally, which is typically where the problems live. Oh God, that's also super true. <laughs> I don't know. For some reason, the human brain, whenever you're painting, is just like, no, 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 no. It's it's zooming in and picking at it that'll fix it. Yeah, yeah. If I just zoom in and pick at it enough, it'll stop looking bad. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like it's not the fact that the eyes are like totally off center. It's that like the ear, the the, the all the folds of the ear haven't been drawn in yet. Yeah, that's got to be it. Yeah. Just spend eight hours. Yeah, I'm gonna take, like super common. I mean, you were like yelling at me about this before, and it ended up being true. I got like stuck on a painting, and then like it just turned out my values were bad. I spent literally twelve hours picking at little like uh -huh. occlusion shadow shapes and things like that, and it was just values. Yeah, it was just the broad broad values. Yeah, I mean, it it always is. If you get the broad strokes right, all the details like they can be kind of whatever. I mean, this is what you see out of really masterful painters is that they will, you'll see somebody who's like really, really good and you'll be like, oh my God, how do they balance all that stuff? And then you realize like the secret is that they just aren't getting that specific. Like a lot of the, 
like with anime stuff it they do end up getting like really really tight in a lot of places but if you look at the really good painters they are willing to let a lot of stuff slide and like that's kind of like where their values are i mean like where their you know priorities are is in trying to figure out where do they need to put the attention where do they and like they're trying to guide the attention of the audience as well so it's like their own personal attention to detail mirrors the attention that of the uh, assumed audience member so they are only like they're being efficient in the way that they're spending their time rendering because they're trying to figure out where does the eye actually land and what is it actually seen and if you can get that right not only can you like paint faster but you will also be far more effective so like i think that's where a lot of the obsession with um efficiency comes from it's because it's like it's not really about the efficiency it's really about like the economy of attention okay super true about frank Frazetta. i was like looking at his stuff for like the weekly challenge or whatever and yeah there's a lot of stuff that's just like a weird blur yeah like frank Frazetta's is allowed to do it yeah frank Frazetta's is allowed to do it like i mean this is why a lot of um A lot of like old school portrait artists are so revered in modern illustration. People like Zorn, it's because they're like that's sort of their whole, that's sort of their whole game is like uh, hyper efficient like forms of painting that like reveal where the eye is really looking. Or, like Sargent, you end up getting a sense on like what is the viewer actually seeing? Like what are the parts of this that actually add up to it being? the thing that you're trying to represent rather than the um like symbolic understanding of the thing like what are we really seeing when we're looking at something because it's not the whole image there's like bits and pieces that are missing but like we're catching on these certain notes whether they're edges or textures or transitions or something Part of the fun of painting is being lazy and not painting the parts you don't care about. Yeah, and it like it sounds super selfish, but that's why I've always recommended that people actually um, just get selfish when it comes to making art, because I found that like when you look at art from a selfish perspective, you end up getting like a more honest, more effective perspective of it. Yeah, modern 3D games have sort of figured out like a, I think there's a kind of a newer model of anime that is three-dimensionally consistent. As long as you like uh, use a certain kind of like shader, as long as it's shaded in a particular way. Um, there's actually some anime games where they just like straight up don't put any detail on the face. I don't know. The problem with anime is no one agrees on what anime is. Oh, uh, yeah, there's that too. But I mean, back in the back in the olden times of the early 2000s, uh, there was a lot of anime styles that were like untranslatable into 3D because like they really relied on the model shifting quite a bit as you went from like straight on to profile. Like oh, the profiles yeah. especially were just like totally jacked up. But like that was the style of the times and so um people people wanted that i wanted that <laughs> <laughs> as a as a anime consumer of the early 2000s i can tell you i wanted to see like the weird jacked up um perspectives like the weird profiles on the and like that that was like i don't know it created a really pleasing stylization but then whenever you try to like move that stuff into 3d it looks like super jacked up and so I think that like we moved away from that in part because a lot of people were making like anime video games and uh, it required and like trying to produce anime characters in 3D for one reason or another. And it forced everyone to kind of like reassess what it meant, like what the what should be what being on model meant. Yeah, I know what you mean about liking the uh, the crazy profiles. That always looks cool. Yeah. Kim's talking about um, learning uh, 
learning art at around eight years old and the teacher was teaching about um give us a comic about the potato famine fam to color in this is definitely uk education we did not get a we did not get a segment on the potato famine when i was eight uh, they instructed us to color in only where the action or attention was it's a pretty good lesson starvation and action yeah i was like I was like skimming through the message and I was like potato famine and then action and attention. I was like, I got to read through this more carefully, figure out how all this stuff fits together. <laughs> yeah. Gesture. It's like the Irish potato famine. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about it, rendering is a lot like the Irish potato famine. <laughs> Paid my tuition for the Huckleberry Art Academy, but all I learned was that rendering is a lot like the Irish potato famine. It wasn't an art lesson; it was a history lesson. But it turned out it was useful. Yeah, I, there's worse things to learn than history. Yeah, this is becoming my go-to gradient map. It's been working on just about everything because it creates this like nice separation of warms and cools kind of mm -hmm. automatically um, and then like building other stuff on top of it it just like always kind of works I wonder if I could I should add another little pip up here to bring in some oranges are these um, default gradient gradient maps in Photoshop or are they like no this is a uh, like saved this is one this is one that's in my uh, yeah that, that's good I want that this one's in my this is a custom Morbacher gradient map that is available on, in the gradient map pack if you go to huckleberry.art and download it for free off of our store. Thank you for the entry point <laughs> of that That's advertisement. <laughs> no problem. Dustin's got the link in the chat, in the Twitch chat. Uh, I've actually been messing around with gradient maps a lot myself. Um, lately you can get some cool results with them uh all the like weird colored fire in the background of like the last piece i did mm -hmm. that was all a hundred percent just like trying to manually paint a gradient with like a chunky brush and then just like accidentally making fire with like a gradient map mm -hmm. i didn't even intend to paint fire but it looked like fire i was like oh okay yeah there could be fire there yep that's my process. <laughs> awesome. That's like, I sure uh, do hope something really cool happens by accident in the next 10 minutes. Oh. And then when something cool happens, I just try to say yes to it and like go with it rather than like, you know, try to preach to the art about what my pure vision is. Ooh, you should yeah. be doing this. It should be like this. It's like, if the art's going to show me something cool, I'll just, like, say yes to it and be like, that's a great idea. Painting, thank you. I appreciate the input. Yeah, it's like a free gift. Yeah. Would you turn it down? Um, yeah, it's pretty fun. Although, um, Krita, uh, I can't figure out how to, like, save gradient maps. So every time I make a gradient map, I'm just, like, making a new gradient map. <laughs> Oh, that's a bummer. I figure out how to do that. I'm sure. I'm sure there's a way to like save them as like presets or whatever. I was just too lazy to figure it out. I like how laziness often ends up actually causing more work for you. It does. It cuts both ways. I think. Yeah. I should really figure out how to save a bunch of gradient maps though. Um. But yeah, it's really fun. Um, the other thing that's cool is like you can um, you can like make a gradient map and then like put it on like a you can like change the blending mode of it and sometimes that does cool things or you mm -hmm. can like you can like have one gradient map on top of another gradient map and then start erasing away part of the one that's on top and like that sometimes makes cool stuff. Yep, <laughs> this is exactly what I uh, the sort of thing that I'm always messing around with. 
Oh, okay. And like, you know, I was talking about, okay, well, it's all rendering is all about these transitions over time. Like oftentimes I'll take like a gradient map and I'll be like, I think this is cool, but I don't like what it's doing to the whole piece. And so I'll like block off a chunk of it. Like I will add a gradient mask to the gradient map. Okay. And so I can make like a transition over the length of the piece in terms of like the gradient map. And that'll give me like an extra sort of color axis potentially. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm actually excited. I kind of that um that like uh like bunny barbarian um I did. I was kind of halfway through painting it badly when you kind of like pulled me aside and like told me all that stuff about gradients and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was like working from like a bad painting I had done underneath basically. But uh, what I'm excited to do is um try setting up a painting with gradient maps specifically in mind where I like get a lot of values and stuff figured out and get everything on like clipping masks and whatnot. And then I have like a huge amount of control over like what each gradient map it does. I can apply like a different gradient map to like each individual piece of the thing. I might be able to make cool stuff. I don't know. I haven't tried it yet, but can to try it on the next one. Yeah. I mean, you can, if you mask it out, like you, you, if you treat each element as like slightly different sort of shader, you can create some really interesting effects. Yeah. Oh, it's cool too. Cause it lets you like paint things that would be a huge pain to do manually. You can have like a smooth gradient where it like starts out warm and then turns cool and then turns warm again and then turns like desaturated. It's cool. Gradient maps are dope. R.L. Stein vibes. I think it's the green. R.L. Stein. I I don't get it. I don't get the association. You're a tool for some unseen part of the universe. Yeah. This is where art can get woo. It, it like art, you can't keep away from being woo. Like you just like the more you spend. I I know I know it's goosebumps. I'm just like I'm trying to figure out how this feels like goosebumps. Oh my god. <laughs> uh added term monster, added term dummy. The I, I think we gotta turn the auto mod fully off. This is it's like we, we it's just every day we're discovering new and and stupid ways in which the auto mod is attempting to like reduce bullying by like preventing us from talking about R. L. Stein books. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait for the robot automated future. Um, because everything's just going to be like that. It's computers screwing up in ways that only a computer would screw up. Uh huh. I don't really want to reproduce the background for this, so I'm just going to create like a rough kind of two color paint field in the background to kind of give a little bit more sense of space. Maybe a horizon Can you line. you paint stuff in the background with a custom brush? It looks kind of cool. Or a textured brush, I mean. Whenever I do it, <laughs> horrible things start happening. I mean, I think it's the lack of carrying that allows it to happen. Okay. It's like you really, you can't be, if you consider like what you want to happen, like it always turns into shit. It's like, it's a commitment to like just seeing what will happen when you put the brush down and removing a sense of expectation that I find like really makes that possible. Okay. Yeah, you know, actually I was kind of, I got that like, gradient in the background of my last piece that I was like kind of happy with and like that really did just come about by accident mm -hmm. like I was just I was literally just being lazy and using a chunky brush to like paint in a gradient badly yeah and then I like accidentally put a gradient map on it that made it look cool and that's literally all I did that's literally no all I do painting. yeah it it like trying to opening yourself up to accidents to happen mentally is a skill 
because like nobody wants to do it. You think like, oh, just like allowing yourself to do whatever is like super lazy. It'd be super easy. But like the truth is, is that like making marks without expectation is actually kind of a hard mental stance to maintain. And so like if you can just be like, I'm going to really just make some marks and see what's going to happen and then sort of be assessing them after the fact, like watching them come together and then being like, oh, you know, I kind of like the way that looks or whatever is happening there and really treat it as like a, a matter of discovery, just sort of being present to like discover things as it's happening is um, it's like a diff it is a, it's a challenging mental state to maintain. And like you still have to do it with some level of reverence for the original work. So like you can't be fully checked out and just be like ruining every inch of the canvas. You have to be open to just sort of discovering stuff and like letting things go bad, but without like fully destroying the thing and setting yourself back. But if you can just chill a little bit, it can unlock something that's really powerful. Now I've got the fucking goosebumps theme in my head. Thanks, Kim. Jesus. <laughs> Let Jesus take the wheel sometimes while you nap in the back. Yeah, exactly. Jesus, take the anime wheel. Yeah, people were like, how did you draw that bunny girl so good? You'd be like, well... I feel like it's more of a matter of Jesus drawing the bunny girl, and I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> the power of my erotic bunny women comes from my uh, the power of my faith. I can't joke about that too much because I, I think I actually might know at least one person that they would say that in private. <laughs> 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 it's like not that cr it's like it's like I'm, I'm saying this in a jokey way but it might actually not be that like far off from some reality for some people yeah probably not wrong I have totally fucked up the shape of the shoe. Like the problem I have with it is that I, I was drawing what I thought a shoe was shaped like instead of just like really looking at the reference. Okay. Well, the shoes are one of those things where they can just kind of be shaped however you want. Like there's a lot of leeway. Yeah. Shoes are like anime. Nobody agrees on exactly what a shoe is. Yeah, what is like. a shoe? I mean, yeah. have we really determined what that means as a society? I don't know. I don't know if we have. I don't know. Scientists are asking this question. Nobody knows the answer. Yep. The government I mean, wants to tell like... you it knows what a shoe looks like. But free thinkers agree. Nobody knows. Um, yeah, but it's like she's but it, like she's got cute shoes on and these are like chunky like construction worker shoes. That's the problem. I want the oh, shoes to be shoes. cute. Oh, uh, yeah, it's got that little swerve that you're adding in. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's like got this big teardropped shape here. Fire's like, Jesus put the knowledge of the art masters in my head while I sleep and you drive. 
I mean, you don't. You can't be fully asleep. It's like you got to be like you know when you're on a long road trip, and you are tired, but you know that if you fall asleep, that you're kind of letting down the person next to you, and so you're trying to tough it out even though you don't have a hand on the wheel because you like feel semi responsible for whether or not the car is about to drive off the road. That's the, I think that's I think the mindset that I'm describing here for more automatic drawing. It's not that you're like completely checked out. You haven't fa- you don't fall asleep, but you do, but you all do like seed the driver's seat, but you're there as like kind of emotional support for the driver, whoever that is. It's probably just like the other half of your brain. Stupid brain. Man, I wish I could get over like the bad feelings that always like come with art. Mm, like, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I've just grown to accept them. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's how you kind of get over them. I think like, it's just a matter of acceptance. Realize. I don't think anyone gets out of sometimes feeling bad about their art quality level. Yeah. I don't know. Fuzzy liminal space between fully conscious and automatic. Yeah, it's a delicate balance, but it's totally doable. And I think like, I I feel like I've been training myself to do it as I make art. Man, I wish you could get over the bad feelings as a whole sentence, yeah. Here is a sentence. Handstitch says the shoe is a boat for mice. I mean, yeah. I'm into it. I'm with you. Uh, I'm like not doing any of the things I said I was going to do when I like painted this. Well, that's like, that's me on most days when I'm trying to do studies. Like, sometimes I'll say what my goals are out loud, and then I will absolutely not do them immediately following that, which is yep. just like, it doesn't mean that I've like done that bad. It just means like, if I'm, I, I need to at least take a few attempts at like trying to live up to my own expectations for myself. Yeah. Mm. trying to make rough marks that look like evenly spaced things but done roughly is a good idea I don't think hmm <laughs> That'll do it. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. <laughs> uh, it, by, for some reason, the um, both the audio, the mic and um, desktop audio in the audio mixer on OBS were muted. I don't know why when I came back that was their default state, but it is. Hey. Oh. I'm just saying, I'm going to say to, to the stream real quick that the... Uh, my power turned off for no apparent reason for about two minutes, and then I had to wait for everything to reboot, all the the router and modem and everything coming back. And uh, it doesn't appear like there's no obvious explanation as to why it happened, which is the always the worst. But anyway, so you guys are saying about drawing out of your head? Yeah, yeah, I just wish, like, um, somebody had told me uh, that, like, it's okay to, like, do it bad, and, like, doing it bad will gradually make you better at it. I don't know. I have this, like, idea in my head that, like, no, no, I have to be doing it correctly in order to be seeing improvements, but uh-huh. it's just, like, not true. Yeah, I don't know. I uh, There was a... Dustin and I were talking about, like, I need to, like, cool it on the teasing a little bit, but, like, I had... I had um, told someone like yeah go ahead and make more bad painting or whatever because it's like i see a lot of and somebody in the comments on youtube was like yo that guy got roasted and i'm like oh well like the way i see doing bad art is it's like a really really productive activity like making bad paintings making bad drawings from your head is like 
the best thing you could yep. abs possibly do if like you're interested in getting better at this stuff. Agreed. Yeah. The more art you do, the better. Like I, what I found is like the more art I do, the more things that, like even even like letting letting the bad drawings come out, like you get more good drawings. Yeah, but like specifically, I, it's it's oh, like the bad drawings are productive. I don't know. It it feels like it shouldn't be productive. It feels like you're screwing up, but like somehow doing it bad over and over again makes you gradually able to do it good in like a way that's not fully explainable. Um, I mean, someone's probably got an explanation for it. I don't. It's just like I, over time, have grown a certain, have grown a certain amount of fondness over bad art because I feel like it's like if I'm producing bad stuff and I'm like accepting that it's bad and I'm like uh, you know aware of the process what's happening, then like I'm making progress. It's it's like I what I really want to avoid is like those moments of like delusional behavior where I'm like no I'm excellent the whole world should be paying more attention to me <laughs> you know <laughs> like I was talking to somebody uh, on a stream and they were talking about oh yeah, yeah I'm in college and they're like do you teach the business of art I was like I happen to teach it quite a bit but like why do you want to know like is there anything specific you want to hear about and they're like oh well I I've got everything else worked out I just need to figure out how to sell it <laughs> and I was like really <laughs> Like, you know, you really, you're like, oh, if only the world could discover my genius, then I'd be set. So all I need to learn right now is marketing. It's like, yeah, it's typically not, not the situation. Thing. Yeah. I'm trying to get into the selling my art. I haven't, I have this whole week off and I'm trying to like kick out a bunch of art. So like I'm, I can sell it. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. Well, yeah, it's like, it, you know, learning the sales side of things is like really, really important. It's just that like, I don't think anyone's in a situation where they're like, uh, yeah, I'm just already kind of a genius and the world just needs <laughs> to know more about me. And that's like the thing I'm missing. So like, how do you do marketing? Uh, yeah, it's like, eh, you know. I, get, I got you, I got you. <laughs> it's like, uh, we're just, there's like, a, there's always more to learn, obviously, but also like, especially if you're like you're in college or younger, like the chances that you're just like so incredibly genius that the only thing that's missing is people having heard of you is like, like that's delusional behavior. I don't tell that to that 15 year old who like Min was telling us about the other day. Jesus. That Filipino 15 year old that's like yeah. looking like a fucking seasoned pro doing Yeah. That. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I wonder, what, like, what are the circumstances of that? Like, typically when I see somebody who's got those skill sets, just because they've spent a certain amount of years on it, and so, yeah. like, even somebody who's pretty young, they usually just got started really young. Like, how, but, like, there's a point where, like, you, you can't get a six-year-old to start drawing anime girls, and then they, like, it, like, sticks with them, and it's going to be, like, a thing they're good at when they're 15. Like, uh, you kind of get a hard reboot around puberty, so it's, like, you you have to if you're 15 you'd have to like get there over the course of like two or three years max which it seems a little bit much to me yeah i don't understand yeah, it's like, crazy if that uh, i like i have a little bit of dubiousness about how possible it is to get to that level at 15. Mm -hmm. i wonder if some of it is yeah. like internet cosplay that's happening like oh yeah yeah i'm a 15 year old oh uh, maybe you know Dude, you guys don't get it. I'm the hidden talent. I'm the one. <laughs> I am. I am the doom bringer. Okay. Yeah. You just you More got all the you heat. jazz. Every good artist in here, minuscule. Nothing compared, compared to, to you. my like brain, just too massive and wrinkly. I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't hold back my my ego anymore. But Sorry. you know. I mean, it's not easy to hold it back when you're as great Dude, as you are. I'm the reason like flexing right now. I'm flexing my muscles. Yeah, I can you feel it from right here because my cam is not. Is that the reason my fucking my... power went out? Did you blow my power out with your pecs? Yeah, <laughs> Dude, I'm the reason why there's earthquakes and tsunamis and all that natural. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Very careful. Don't make me flex. It's, it's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, I know. Don't make me flex. All right. Jesus. <laughs> So Pete, did you read like 
did you like read a lot of books to get as good as you are now? Like, how did you? A hundred percent. No. Would... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like oh man, you're really good at basketball. Do you read a lot of basketball books? <laughs> uh -huh. Like it, it, this, is like my new metaphor is it's just like everyone has this idea about art that it's like all like it's all like wisdom and and like academic. It's like it's it's a it's just like a sport. I think it's just a game. And like you just gotta play the game to get good. Yeah. They mentioned that. It's like you're really like good I've... at you're really good at Counter Strike. You really read a lot of books about Counter Strike. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's weird that like if you, you think about people reading books for art, but like not for anything else. Um. No, I mean people do read books about you know philosophy on sports and stuff, and like there is. It's not that there's nothing to say. It's just that like we understand more intuitively that like when it comes to a physical game a physical pursuit of any kind that like obviously in order to get to the highest levels you need to just it's it's like a certain amount of like fluency just in the in the physical activity of it like you're just not going to get past a certain point without putting a certain number of hours of balling you know you just need to ball <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I feel that. Um, like, but it's like if you were to only ever play pickup games and you never actually like did any drills and you never actually did any conditioning, like you know that you would never make it to the NBA. Like, you need to like, it's got to be a combination of like academic learning, like conditioning, training, and like and practice. Like, they all have a place in in building an athlete. And so, if we think about art as like a sport. Like, you understand, like, you know, going and doing drills and, like, studies and stuff, definitely good for, you know, building out, like, your skill set. But it's, like, applying the skill set is the primary thing that we need more of if we want to, like, really achieve higher goals. And, like, um, for some reason, it, uh, the culture of art right now on the Internet doesn't respect that as much as it should and i don't know exactly why but um that's like been my re big revelation recently because i've been looking into a lot of education and it's uh like what are other institutions teaching and like you know what is the general attitude of what people want and what are people looking for and i'm realizing that like there's this total mismatch there and it's exactly that thing so it's like i'm not picking on you this is like a thing that's becoming like a like a big thing that i think about a lot recently yeah so yeah i i did like lots and lots and lots of like thousands of really shit drawings uh because i like i was in school for a lot of it and i wish i was anywhere else and so i would rather i could like listen to the teacher and pick up just enough info so i was just like banking sheets of um of like pa printer paper i just steal printer paper from the school and like have a folder full of it and just work through printer like sheets of printer paper while I was in class in high school and that kind of got me like in being good enough where I felt like it was worthwhile for me to go to art college and then in art school it was again more printer paper but also just like piles of sketchbooks and um you know doing personal projects in addition to my school projects and just like lots and lots and lots of hours of, of like reps of, like making not of like studying and of, like I never studied, like I never did studies during all that time. I just was like trying to apply those skills all the time by making more, drawing my OCs, making more drawings, putting stuff out on the internet. Like that was the only thing I cared about. Um, and it paid off in terms of me like building a skill set at art. And um, I think anybody I think anybody who follows that model of just like making a shitload of art that they care about and always trying to achieve better with it will can get pretty good without ever studying. But if you study also, you'll be even better. <laughs> like I, I was probably held back quite a bit by the fact that I didn't study during those years. Yeah, it's hard to say. Like, I don't know. Like we don't have any like controlled experiments like see what the best way to learn an art is and like 
Maybe I need to interview yeah. that like Filipino fifteen year old and figure out what the fuck. Like, like number one, are you really fifteen? <laughs> number two, how the fuck? Like, we, like when did you start? Like, what have you been doing? Like, what has your focus been? Like, let's see the progression over the course of the last two, three years. Like, I would be really yeah. curious to see like how does someone get to that level in a couple of years? Like, what? Yeah, is, actually, what, yeah. What are the circumstances that of that? That guy, if he's legit, no. Yeah, we gotta bug him in and like get this person, see if they like. We can get somebody to translate if they don't speak English. Wait, yeah. who who is this person? It was somebody that was doing a commission for Min. Min was like doing something on stream where he was like art directing this thing. He was like making notes and like edits on this piece, and everyone kept popping in, going like, "Yo, that piece is awesome!" And he kept having to say like, "Oh, it's not mine. It's some fifteen-year-old from the Philippines that I'm paying to make a piece for me." Huh. And I was like. No fucking way. <laughs> like, at first, I, at first, I thought you guys were joking, and then I was like, "Oh wait, they're actually serious about it." Yeah, well, that's the thing is, I would if that's really what's going on. Like, I'd be curious to know, like, what are the circumstances? Because, hey, if we could figure out how to like a person could get like professional level of quality art in two years of study, that would be revolutionary. Because, like. I've watched people bust their asses for four years out ringling and like just barely make it out the other end. So like, what does it take to be able to like do that over the course of like at the age of 15 requires you to start when you're like thir 12, 13 and like treat it that ed your education like a job to, in order to get that level of good by the time you're 15, right? Like, yeah. I'm just trying to run the numbers on this because it's not like you can just say like, oh, yeah, this 15 year old is really good. But like, look, OK, so how good were they when they were 14? How good were they when they were 13? Like, show me the let's do the math on this because it's an interesting concept. Yeah, I know um, I used to know someone who they're they're 18, they're 19, they're 19 now. Yeah. No, I've uh -huh. met some really incredible 19 year old artists and I'm like, and then I talked to them and they're like, yeah, yeah. I started basically treating it like full-time art education when I was like, no, yeah, they 14, always say 15. that I started taking it seriously and I'm like, huh? Okay. Yeah. They start taking it seriously when they hit their teen years. And then by the time they're like 19, they're like a uh, world-class. Yeah, like, dude, they're, it's insane. It's doable. Like I, I've watched it happen a couple of times. It's like, but you have to have the foresight and dedication as like a teenager, which most people don't. Cause like, you don't, most teenagers don't want to pick any one thing to be like their identity. Like it's really strange for people that young to just sort of like throw themselves into a specialization, which is why we don't see it very often. It's like, but if you, if somebody does happen to do that, they can achieve like really incredible results. Cause it doesn't matter what age you put those five years of intense dedication into, it just matters that you've spent like five years focusing exclusively on like one set of skills. Yeah, I, uh, kudos to them. That's all I'm saying. They, yeah. they, they start taking something seriously and they're actually pouring their heart out to get better at a crazy pace. But yeah, if it, the idea of like the, 15 year old who's like already working at a professional level, I would imagine that maybe they're just, uh, they're just role playing a little bit online and that they're, if they're like actually 19, like that makes a way more sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, oh yeah, yeah, I started doing this really hard when I was 15 and I just always tell people I'm still 15. It's like, that would make sense to me. Yeah, that's fair. A certain amount of online anonymity, you know, certain amount of pride you know people people play up stuff on the internet all the time who knows i guess we we're gonna have to look into it more it's a it's an internet mystery we should like um you should like ambush them you know ambush interview oh uh who does ambush interviews who would it be like i think you know what? I think it's always good to try things out. So I, I, I want to nominate you, uh, Pete. You want to nominate me to start being the guy who does ambush interviews of artists on the internet? Yeah, I, I want to nom because like you sound, you know, you know what they say, don't, uh, what was it? Don't 
until you try it. Something don't until you try it. Uh, don't knock it? Don't, yeah, don't knock it until you try it. <laughs> ambushing people on the internet to try it. I don't know what, how do I ambush them? Like, be like, they're in a Discord and I'm just like, I'm like so fucking Coffeezilla and I pop in there out of, out of nowhere and I'm like, I mean, you, you usually have Dustin around you and you probably have like other people. So like you could have, I, I don't want to like <laughs> overwhelm them. You could have like five, six people join in at the same time. And like, they all ask questions simultaneously. Oh, know? we could like attack them as like a squad. Yeah. Kind of like, oh, there he is. Right. And like, um, if, if you want to like slowly build up the pressure, Mm -hmm. You could join in like increments of one. Constius the fourth says we could cut him open and study his brains and organs, like Akira. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, fuck. We got a raid before. Did we? Did we just get a raid now? Am I? I think my. I think my something is broken because of the power outage. We got a. Uh, uh, what do you we guys? We just got a raid now. Yeah. Oh hey, welcome raiders. Welcome from uh, raider from Chloe's Ah. My notifications are busted. <laughs> I just had, just got back from a power outage. <laughs> Welcome, Raiders. <laughs> I'm in the middle of doing some art study, as you can see. Uh, and we are talking about uh, what it takes to be really good at art at like super young ages. We've met some weird outliers. I've never been that outlier. I started, I started getting into art when I was like 16. And I never, I didn't really know how to study it in like a crazy serious way until like I was way older. And so I, I didn't really get like noticeably good at art until I was like in college. And, um, and like it was, there, there was some time in college where I feel like I, I kind of broke the formula. Uh, are you South African per chance? LOL, I am not. power outage yeah it was weird i'm in florida but it wasn't a storm it wasn't an alligator uh it wasn't the construction guys outside it was a mystery we had a it was very mysterious everyone was very shocked um i think that when it happened uh, most of the viewers their hats spun around in a circle and their jaws actually dropped happened open because i flexed my muscles yeah 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 you're spreading misinformation <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How long have you been doing art then? I've been doing art for a long ass time. Um, I am 40, I'm turning 40 next month. And I was started art when I was 16. Ah, rolling blackouts here in South Africa every day. Oh, that makes it tough. You got to control, you got to have a quick trigger finger that control S because you never know what's going to hit you three or four times per day for two hours at a time. Dang. Yeah, I was saying yesterday I had a computer for a while, for years, that would randomly reboot at like weird intervals. And so I just got like a itchy trigger finger for hitting control S. So whenever I thought finished thinking of anything, I would control S almost instantaneously. And that was like my saving grace. That was the only way I was able to like um, continue to make art through those years where I had that busted ass computer. I built it myself. I still can't believe you built it and you and you didn't you you put it together. I still can't believe I put it together. You yeah, you know I bought all the parts, should... I put it together and then I I fucked something up. Why didn't you just look into it like oh maybe maybe something's not connected well? You know, I put it together so I should be able to I did a lot. Like I spent I I went and people I talked to people and they were like, "Oh, it's definitely cuz you got too low of a voltage power supply." So I would like buy a new power supply and I'd swap out the power supply. And like, I swapped out basically every piece on it. And then I realized like, by the end, it was just like just a motherboard and processor that was left. And so I just like, um, I don't know. I, I, I just, just like, oh, wait a minute. I think I just have, I think I just like did the, I, maybe I did like the, what do you call it? The thermal paste bad. Uh, yeah. or something like that and and that was the reason why it was like forever b broken and then and uh oh. eventually i made enough money where i bought a new computer but it was many years so is it your current it's your current one isn't it no 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 and this was this was years ago i have enough money now where i can go and buy a computer if it, if my main work computer randomly rebooted i would fucking like 
drop kick it into the sun without a second's <laughs> notice. Like it's so important to me to be able to like work effectively that like I will go to extraordinary lengths to avoid those kinds of inconveniences. So it's your baby. Uh, I don't know. I don't love it that much. It's got, it's, it, I want a better computer. I just like also don't like waste. And so I, I'm waiting until I absolutely need to in order to go get a big upgrade. Yeah. What's your, what is your build? I got a 1080. Oh, oh wow. Which 1080. was like good at the time I got it. But I mean, we're four generations of graphics cards ahead of where I am right now. So I tried buying mm -hmm. like, was it remnant two? hot new game on steam and it runs like absolute trash on my machine like the latest games that are running like the latest like ue like five stuff i'll run terribly still on a yeah. 1070 scraping by yeah it's fine it's fine i mean it's like um happy you can catch one of my streams yeah i'm glad you could uh catch one of my streams too i i uh I don't know. Like, I think a 1070 is perfectly fine for running Photoshop. It's just that, like, you want to, like, play anything with ray tracing in it? Like, fucking forget about it. Like, you know. Oh, dude, the, the new GPUs have, uh, I think, live ray tracing. Yeah. I, it's insane. I think it's, isn't mainly on the 4090 more than anything? No, I, I think from the 30 series forward has, like, some amount of ray tracing capability. Yeah, dude, I am, um, you know, I, I ended up getting a MacBook Pro rather than, I regret it when I regret it, but for the most part, it's a good laptop. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I never liked laptops though. I, I always like uh, working on a desktop. I love I spreading out multiple monitors, like a fancy keyboard, tablet laid out in front of me and mouse, like tons of desk space, tons of extra bits of gear attached to it. Like, um, I like having the battle station that I can kind of strap into and, and go crazy on. Like, I've got so much extra, like, dials and knobs and, like, my Stream Deck, which <laughs> needs to get rebooted or something because, like, since the power outage is just showing me, like, the logo. But Do you have the Stream Deck, too? Uh, it's one of them. I don't know. It's got 15 buttons, and it uh, looks pretty good. Yeah. Oh, you have the. Yeah, they came out with a new one. It has a mini LED, like a mini LED touch screen, uh -huh. and you can swipe left and right to change pages. Uh, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, ten buttons. No, eight, eight buttons. It has four knobs, and you can use the knobs. Oh, to like... I saw that. I was like, that's. But the thing is, is that I already spent a bunch of money on a what something called a PC panel, which is like four knobs that are like turnable and clickable and programmable and stuff and i was like i still love my pc panel so i kind of don't want to spend more money on a thing just to like basically invalidate my beautiful little yeah. knobby boy yeah that's fair honestly they, they cost uh -huh, they easily cost 150 plus dollars those sort of gadgets mm, so. yeah but i needed it like starting streaming like you absolutely need something to be able to like control your scenes and stuff trying to do it all through the UI, even across two monitors, it feels impossible. I was thinking about getting a third monitor now that I've started streaming. Wow. Third monitor. Yeah. I, Getting mega fancy. Well, I, um, I don't know. I love my, I love my stream deck. The best part of it is that I can change, like when you click the rotary, the, the knob, mm -hmm. it changes the user and you can either mute them or like turn down the volume or put it up. Oh, wow. It's pretty neat. I was like, wait, you can do that? <laughs> pretty sick stuff. Is that you twisting knobs there? It's like weird clicking noises in the background? Oh, no, no, no. That's just my MacBook because oh. I I, uh, I did a, like when you do, you know how like on Windows when you try to do something, it gives like, a, it does like the window sound. Ah, mm-hmm. For the, for the MacBook, it's like a woodpecker sound. Oh, okay, I see. Let's see. What do I want to do with this thing before I call it a day? I definitely need to give her a better looking face. Um, I feel like it could be more economical with some of the stuff. Like, I want to add a little bit of patterning and whatnot, but I don't want to just meticulously be working in all the patterning manually. I feel like I should be able to do something that's like a little bit um, more efficient. 
I mean, any of you raiders, if you, they, Dustin, can you s smack the Discord button? I'm, I'm, oh yeah, yeah, the, the Huckleberry Discord thing is just in the chat there. Uh, I'm streaming outside of the Huckleberry Academy, Art Academy Discord. We've got a really, really active art Discord going on right now. Um, there's voice chat in here every single day. There's a really active community. The vibe here is like really chill. Everyone's really interested in seeing each other like make good art and um, and help helping each other learn. And so it's been awesome vibes. So if you guys are looking for an art discord that's like really active um, and like a good vehicle for like doing studies and stuff, uh, you should come check out what we got going on. I'm pretty proud of the whole thing. So is Dustin like your, you could say, stream manager? Uh, Dustin and I are collaborating to build uh, Huckleberry. And he is like acting kind of like a producer on the streams where he's like, he has the knowledge of how everything works and he is like creating the hookup on a lot of stuff. Like he's, you know, feeding me links and like doing research and looking over data and uh, also helping make sure that like uh, people get linked to stuff and things are hooked up correctly like across the whole stream discord ecosystem which I mean there's always a lot of that to do when I was first like trying to get this set up I was thinking like oh my god I really need help with this and then I started to do it and I was like I don't know I'm worried that like if I have someone helping me like there won't be enough to do and that was turned out to be unfounded. There is always, always shit that needs to get done. Trying to run a stream on a semi-daily basis is such a, a big undertaking. Having somebody else to help out with that has been gigantic and being able to do it uh, effectively. Yeah, that, okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, this yeah, is always I feel a lot of people handle. underestimate streaming. Dustin is also an excellent source of very good fitness advice, like microwaving gummy bears. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Dustin's in pretty good shape. He microwaves gummy bears. Though. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just a joke he made that has been stuck in my head ever since. I don't get what. What was the context of microwaving gummy bears? Oh, um, we were Jackalack's been like trying to gain weight um and like get calories in and like we were suggesting methods to do that and in the background dustin is just typing like you gotta microwave a bunch of gummy bears and then drink them when dustin i remember that there was times where dustin was like bulking up and he'd show up to like a show up to like a social gathering with like a fucking chipotle burrito bowl <laughs> and then a tupperware container full of chicken like uh, roasted chicken breast and be like piling on extra chicken breasts on top of the Chipotle burrito bowl. And then just be like eating it as like the first thing during the hangout. Just like That's piling awesome. that in. And then we'd be like, oh, you want to order pizza later? He'd be like, yeah, I could do a little pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, dude, I have a hard time bulking. Uh, I, uh, I remember eating like ice cream for a whole week. Tub of ice cream. Each, each day for a whole week. Damn. Gained nothing in pounds. Nothing? Nothing. I don't think that's the Fuck. intended... I don't think that's like... I don't think, I don't think that's why you're supposed that. to bulk up. It's by eating ice cream. Like, I, I ate unhealthy. I, I I ate ice cream. I ate out. I was like, we're going we to eat greasy, you know, that's fast That's an okay food. way. Like, if you struggle with bulking, like, junk food it up. Like, do what you gotta do. Get those calories in. Yeah, I, I gave up on it, though. <laughs> I gave up. Because afterwards, I would feel so unhealthy. Like, I would feel lethargic. And, you know, when you eat, you know, these really unhealthy foods, you don't really feel that good afterwards. No, like, yeah. I, I would feel like terrible if I was just well. eating ice cream as, like, whole meals and shit in the middle of the day. Like ice cream, like sugar, fucking knocks me down. It, it like drains my energy. It makes me feel gross when I eat a lot of sugar. So like I try to avoid it because it makes my tummy hurt. <laughs> <laughs> His tummy. <laughs> I wish I had this superpower where my body punished me for making bad decisions, but it doesn't. 
Oh yeah. That I just get fat if I continue making bad decisions. Yeah. Well, I do too. Of time. But I also feel extra physically bad on top of also getting fat. But you you think I would have incentivized me to make nothing but good decisions over the years, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> Right. Well, I got my study done. You got your study done? You want to post? Can I post it? Are you going to post it somewhere? Yeah, it's in my sketchbook. And it's oh, in the, do, you, um, do you know what's blowing my mind? Is like, I love that uh, piece that um, Adam did for the Frazetta challenge. And then I haven't seen him post it anywhere. Oh, damn. That is a good piece. It's mind blowing. It's a really good piece. Really and do. I was like wondering, like, is it because it didn't get picked or something? I know. I, I was surprised that like Sarah wasn't into it. I guess she's not as into the darker stuff. Yeah, me too. I was a hundred percent sure it's like okay, that one's that one's getting first place. <laughs> like, if I was in charge, uh, uh, it, I mean, I can't, I'm in charge of this, but I'm like, if I was the one who was like the primary person picking, like, I would. It, I mean, it just totally was working for me. But uh, agreed. Honestly, there were so many good entries, though. <laughs> like, there was a lot of really good ones. I just, I get, I mean, I had a soft spot for that one. I thought that was a, a really strong Adam piece, too. Yeah. Dude, people don't post enough. I mean, I guess I also don't post enough. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> you're like, oh, people don't post enough stuff, and you, here you are sitting on like a few hundred character designs you haven't posted. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's true. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's like some people in this Discord where like they've actually built like um, like small fan bases on like websites without even trying. Like uh -huh. they've posted like fan art of stuff and it got like you know quarter of a million views or whatever. And they're just now I'm just like not gonna post all this like dope fan art I do for fun. Huh. I'm curious who you, who you're talking about here. I don't. You don't need to blow anybody up, but like. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can say it. like Stevie. Like he he's he's got like six thousand followers on Twitter, and it's just from like a few posts where he did like fan art, and it like blew up. But uh -huh. he'll do these like really good drawings, and um, just while we're hanging out in Discord, that would probably be popular on the internet if he would just post them. Huh. Um, no, no, the thing is that I. I, I know Stevie for a while. The thing is that every time he tries to build up a platform, it, it never goes the right way for him. So he's just like, okay, we're just going to stop posting. What? It was going great for him. That Wind Waker fan art he did, it got like a cra I forget what the number was, but it was a big number. It was like a very big number. And like he oh, does... He yeah, yeah. Um, I, I sent you over the Filipino kids' socials. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Do you think he's 15? Zinder Freak? This is who we were talking about earlier. Rookie. The drawing he had was just, like, so freaking good. It seems like he's better at drawing than painting. But like for a 15 year old, this is pretty dope. If it's a 15 year old, just some wallpaper. Man's uh, good, regardless of his age. Yeah, really good, really good stuff. But uh, yeah, that drawing, the newest drawing that was posted that like he did for Min was really sick. Yeah. There was just like a lot of little subtleties to the anatomy that I thought was like really spot on. And it was like a super dynamic piece. I don't feel like anything in this portfolio is showing the same level of quality that we saw on that drawing on Discord last night. Yeah, it's a bit up and down. Uh, which is what you would expect out of somebody who's younger. You know, they're learning fast. And so it's like a little inconsistent. But, I mean, my fucking portfolio is up and down. Yeah, it's like tough to make a portfolio that's really consistent. But uh, yeah, they're drawing. Yeah, their last drawing. I'm, I'm wondering if this is not even their latest stuff. When is this one posted? Posted three months ago. Yeah, if they're young, three months difference could have meant a lot, especially if they're producing a lot of pieces. Interesting. Worth more explanation. Yeah, it's like... 
what I was seeing out of the anatomy was like way above what I'm seeing here with like the abs here and stuff. <laughs> Drawing's pretty tight. I don't know. We'll see. We'll, we'll dig into the mystery more of, uh, oh, what was the person's name again? Nick Zinders. I feel like I like I started off. Maybe I was starting off by the power outage, but I feel like I was starting off today with like a certain like feeling of like, oh, I'm I'm working in new and innovative ways, and it's like really panning out. To like me feeling like I'm just kind of picking away at stuff in an unproductive way that is like feeling very much like I'm falling back on bad habits. Last two days, like. It's been easy for me to just kind of fall back on like my old bad habits on stuff. Let's see, gotta pull chat back up. Talented introductions should be banned. They make the rest of us insecure. Now, I mean, people can, everybody's gonna be insecure if you're gonna be insecure. It's like, you get a choice on whether or not you're gonna be celebrating other people's wins all the time. Uh, uh, it's also like, you can get like like feel bad about yourself by like seeing people who are like really young succeeding but the other takeaway mm. you can get from it is like man it takes a long time to get it good at art but it doesn't take a lifetime if it did people wouldn't be able to do it when that's they true that is a hundred percent true Try to DM Nick Zinders on Twitter. We got a stupid Twitter blue thing. Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to make a list in my head of like all the things that I want to touch before I can call this one finish. Like I was having a conversation with Ash about this the other day. It was like, like that this is like, for me, it used to be a thing I had to do manually was actually like stop and take notes on like, here are the five things that I need to finish before I can call this thing done. And like nowadays it's like this kind of sub process that runs in the background where it's like, I'm like, making these lists of things that I need to do to like call a piece finished. I am definite, I'm gonna I'll be attacking things different tomorrow. This is like, I'm so frustrated with my, with my work today. I'm I like it, Pete. Well, thank you. I think you did a good job. I think I can do way better than this. And, uh, I need to swap some things around. I need to make some different choices here if I'm gonna like get different results. Um, I was actually like mega impressed by what you were doing with like the lasso tool earlier. I know, I was like, like, I was like, oh, I'm fucking got it today. I'm like, not only am I trying new things, but they're succeeding like effortlessly. This is so good, I'm gonna be great at this today. And then as it went down the line, I was just like, I am going to embrace all of my oldest worst habits and then like pivot into feeling kind of bad about the progress today. Oh, but dang, I actually did the same thing today, like off to a great start. And I was like, man, I'm going to like try all this stuff that I've been learning. Yeah. And then I just defaulted to like old habits because I was like busy talking. <laughs> yeah. I'm like already committed to it. So it's like, ah, uh, might as well just finish it. Oh, I'm so away. excited about the start of this one. So excited. Well, that's all right. That's why you do them every day. Yeah, that's why I do them every day. Worst case scenario, I just end up, you know, nope. doing it, getting a fresh reboot tomorrow. Hundreds and hundreds of chances to nail it. Yeah. All right. I think I'm going to sign off. All right, I stayed have a good up one. Dream. <laughs> I'm going to bed. Good night. Wait, was it nighttime you for you? Stay, you stay up all night? Uh, yeah, I screwed up my sleep schedule, and I'm just doing the like stay up later and later every day to like gradually reset it. That's why I've been missing the streams. I've been awake oh. at like 
night. <laughs> yeah, oh, this weird. happens. All right. Well, good luck. Yeah. Have a nice night. Have a nice sleep. Right. Whatever it is. Uh, yep. Uh, bye, everybody. Bye. Ty Mellist is saying, is it poor practice to work until burnout? Take a break for a week or two, then get back to practice. I don't know any other way to do it. I'm either practicing constantly for weeks or not at all. I don't think that is the best way to do it. Uh, personally, I don't think that working to burnout is a good plan for most people in most circumstances. I think that like you're better served by figuring out a way to like practice. Like I've been doing like one study a day because I've been able to keep up with one study a day basically indefinitely. Or like, I think I've pared it back down to just like maybe about four or five studies a week, just because I'm, um, uh, the stream, the way I'm doing the stream on Friday doesn't really lend itself to study. And then I also am like not doing work on the weekends, but like that break, like a break on the weekend to actually refresh when I'm feeling kind of burnt by Friday instead of like pushing through into the next week and getting progressively more and more burnt until I need to take a huge amount of time off, I get way more done by actually just taking care of myself. And I really think that that is like the big brain strategy in most cases is to like take care of yourself and not just get totally fucking toasted for the purpose of like feeling like you should always be working and you're, you're like a piece of shit if you're not working. Like, I think it's, it's really important to like just manage your energy level and manage your attention so that like you can keep coming back to it when you need to and keep a regular ass schedule. Cause like there's very few circumstances that allow you to just sort of like devolve into like, eh, I'm not gonna be productive for the next couple of weeks because I burn myself out really bad. It's like you need to do, like in most cases people expect you to do better. And like, I honestly, I, I think I'm, I'm happier and um, I feel better more often now that I've like gotten better and better at being able to manage my burnout level instead of like working so intensely that I end up like completely roasted and then I have to like um, reset over the course of like a month. You know, it's it's not, I've done that and it sucks. And it's like, it's a bad experience and I don't think it's like led to me being overall more productive. So it's it's a lose-lose. Um, you know, like there's this, there's this idea of progression. Uh, I'm, I'm reading your comment, um, time lost. It's like, there's this idea of progression where it's like, people need to like grind XP and they need to like speed run art. And I just don't, I don't believe in it. Like I've never believed in a sort of like linear progression in art just because like, that's not what I've seen out of the careers of the people that I've known over my time doing art. It's, um, it's less it's it's less about like a kind of like progression towards building a skill set and it's like it's more like everybody is kind of up to different stuff and everybody has like different sort of things that they're naturally good at and things that they naturally care about and it, it's it all kind of um it's not like it's never really a straight line like no one ever really learns in a straight line and so there's a lot of meandering that has to take place in order for you to discover like what is valuable to you and what you want to dig deeper on and like what's more natural for you than the other people who are like up to the same sort of thing. So like, I, I think that like when you end up um, pushing yourself really hard to like get something that you see as like an objective form of progression, then like you're likely to lose sight of what's important to you about art and just get lost in this idea of like grinding and leveling up. And it's just, it's not, it, it's just, it doesn't, it, it leads to dead ends. It leads to dead ends that like you are not going to see coming if you focus too much on a kind of perfectly linear progression or treat it just like a trade skill, I think. That's been my experience watching. When I watch other people like try to do that, they tend to like reach a certain level and then they like 
they get stuck. And that being stuck is not like them failing to learn more. It's like failing to accept like their own artistic taste and identity. And like, you know, there's a certain amount about art that's inherently personal and that's not going to change just because you like really, really want it. So like in those cases, the people typically get unstuck by like learning more about, you know, their preferences and the way they like to work and like what their what their personality is and like getting to know themselves and like learning that rather than learning like lighting anatomy rendering all like the things that we see as fundamental it's like the more fine art skills that end up getting people unstuck once they get in that position and uh but there's also not a lot of resources for that so people either like have a sort of personal epiphany or they develop right relationships with people who understand this stuff or like in a lot of cases, they just get like permanently stuck at a tier that they think is like a low tier, and they get it drives them fucking crazy. They drives them completely nuts. And there's like a lot of people who are stuck in that sort of situation. Like I've, I sort of specialized in like working with people who were stuck in that way over the last ten years, and so I've gotten to work firsthand with people in that. But I've just seen it around everywhere at trade shows on art station, like thousands and thousands of people who are sort of stuck in this like weird middle zone where they're like intensely trying to study and take all the workshops and learn all the things, learn all the skills. And yet they find themselves stuck in ways that they don't fully understand. That is like a uh, really, really common, really kind of scary. Cause like, I mean, just, I mean, you can just imagine that like, you know, you're accelerating, accelerating, everything's going awesome for you in your art career. And like, you're like, I can do it. I can make it. I just need to keep pushing. And then like it stops for, and you don't know why. And then it just stays stopped for like multiple years. Like that, it, that's a scary moment. It's a really scary moment. anybody has any questions or whatever I'm on, we got a decent number of people here on chat if there's anything you guys want to talk about or questions you got uh i'm gonna spend a couple more minutes on this thing and i would love to be able to like have something to bounce off of if you guys have anything for me i managed to recover the file yeah it was like most of the file was recoverable like the auto recover in photoshop gave me I think I lost about 10 minutes worth of work. I think it auto saves every 10 or 15 minutes. What's your favorite food? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm partial to, I, I really like regional cuisines. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, so I'm a big fan of uh, Italian beef and like Chicago style hot dogs. <laughs> and uh, not, not so much deep dish pizza. I like the, I like the uh, tavern style Chicago pizza more. Less famous, but way better. I have a custom pizza that my family and friends often have with me when I'm back in Chicago. And it's a Hawaiian pizza with jardinier. So it's, uh, uh, ideally it's a Tortorisi's thin crust with ham, pineapple, and jardinier, which you really can't get jardinier outside of Chicago. It's like a kind of like pickled vegetable and pepper mix <laughs> that's like got i think some history it's like italian but it's got like specific history in chicago the pete yeah you know order it over at ryan's house the guys well i I'll, i guess i'll be there in pizza if i'm not there in person Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like I like to give advice to people about this kind of stuff. Like this is these this is really generalized advice. Like it, it's one of the major pitfalls of like giving advice on the internet is that if you don't know who you're talking to, like it's really easy to say the wrong thing because the truth of the matter is is that everything that's true for one person, the opposite is true for somebody else. So if you don't know them, if if people don't know you, it doesn't matter. Like I've watched people get advice from the very best artists in the world and it's led them a hundred percent the wrong direction it doesn't matter how smart the person is you're talking to if they don't know you you cannot trust what they're saying ever when it like you you should take it everything everybody says as a data point 
and then make your own choices based off of what's right for you. Because unless somebody knows you really well, like they're mentoring you closely or a friend who's known you for a long time, somebody you're working with, like you need to be, everyone needs to be like super skeptical of the advice that they receive in passing, whether it's like a portfolio review you got at a convention or advice you got from somebody on the internet or class you took once, all that shit. I've watched people like throw away years of their life trying to chase like a single dumb piece of advice that somebody gave offhandedly that they did not know the person that they were talking to or like what was important to them. And like, you know, we really respect our art heroes. And so it's really easy for us to like absolutely fall off the rails by following along with advice that is like given to us in a cavalier fashion. So be careful out there. The pizza, pizza. Yeah, the pizza. I don't know if you saw this earlier, but I suggested a talking point video topic about using cheats in art, tracing, photo bashing, especially for client work because no one talks about it. Does no one talk about it? I'm gonna write that down because that is a good point. Uh, people should cheat more. Uh, but, 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 I was just writing down a thing. Let's see, Huckleberry video, video scripts, video ideas. How to cheat at art. I'm trying to bank a bunch of video topic ideas because I, I like <laughs> I said this yesterday. I was, I was like, I don't remember why I didn't like record a video on Monday. Like, I think I just like, I think I just went to a fugue state after I got off stream and like played Armored Core instead. And then um, like, I was like, yesterday I was like, oh, I'm not gonna do that today. Today I'm gonna get off stream and I'm gonna do that. And I got off stream and I looked at my phone and I realized I was 10 minutes out from having a two hour appointment. And <laughs> it's like absolutely no opportunity for me to record anything. So I was like, uh, okay, well that's not, that day is not gonna happen either. So now I'm like, today, I'm like, today's the day. I'm gonna do it. Like, there have been literal scandals and cancellations over it. Yes, I've seen the, the scandals and cancellations. I think it would be really interesting to actually create a video that goes into detail about how like, hey, this stuff's all really standard. And then here, here's a point where somebody got bullied fully off of DeviantArt for doing something that is like a basic thing that like art professionals do every single day. Um, that would make, I think, for a pretty good video. Kind of offhand, but I remember your old podcast, I think. You were talking about one of your old artworks. And your co-host said, I really like the face that you did. And you just straight, yeah, I traced it, and that's why the face looks good. Yep. Well, like, it, it's like, that's kind of half true, though, because the, the full truth of it is that, like, um, back when I was first learning to do illustration, I had a couple of instances where I was fully stuck on trying to draw a face. Like I needed to draw a beautiful woman. And so I go, okay, well, I'm gonna f I can't draw, I, I don't know how to draw women. So I'm just going to like find the most beautiful photograph of a woman I possibly can and I'm gonna trace it. And then I, I went to try to do that and like I, it still looked like awful. And that's when I realized that there was actually a bunch of subtleties that I needed to learn that transcended just like the like the structure of the piece, but the ways in which it was like lit and like rendered in more subtle ways. And so there's like layers of learning that still go beyond tracing, but boy, like, you know, tracing is an excellent place to start. And it's the, it's the right place to start for a lot of people in a lot of scenarios. And uh, yeah, the more, prof the more professionals are, are around during a conversation, the more people are gonna be generally open to it. And the more you're like kind of in like insular online spaces where it's a lot of uh, insecure amateurs, the, the more you're gonna see people like uh, poo poo a lot of things that are like generally pretty standard. So you gotta read the room a certain amount when like you hear people like talking about things like 
saying that that something is gross or lame or like bad or like unprofessional, uh, consider whether or not the people that you're talking to actually have any experience whatsoever with like existing as professionals. Uh, sometimes somebody's just like a feet like a year ahead of the people around them, and then everyone looks up to them like they're like a fucking art god, and it's like they literally have only done slightly more D and D commissions than you on Twitter. Like, don't listen to what this person's saying and treat it as though that's how the world works. Like, um, that, like, again, like, get data. Treat everything that you hear from people as data points and then make extrapolations for yourself. Like, the, the more kind of, like, different um, community spaces you can pop in on, the more different cultures you can, like, have some experience with. Like, I mean, my, like, the culture is not just like internationally, but I mean like art cultures. Like there's a bunch of people who do conventions. There's a bunch of people who work in game studios. There's a bunch of people who just do like licensing. And the more you can learn about like the different kinds of business practices and the different ways people make money and the different things that people value in art, like whether it comes to like uh, fine art or illustration or like concept art or whatever, you'll start to see that like there's a lot of different ways of like there's a lot of different attributes of art that you can value and a lot of different things like that are that are like just not they're just not universally true. They're just true differently for different artists uh, and in different kind of art cultures. So like if you can like get out if you can like escape the matrix a little bit and like see the ways in which the people around you are kind of just like all parodying each other instead of speaking universal truths, like the better off you're going to be at understanding like um, you know, the information you're learning, how it all exists in a context. <laughs> um, well, Dustin's saying, I wonder if one self-imposed barrier that beginners have is that beginners should start out drawing from imagination and not using references because they see, because non-artists see it as cheating. Um, I wonder if one beginners is that beginners should just draw art from imagination and not use references. Yeah. Well, here's the thing is like the problem I see with a lot of people who are kind of early on is that like they, they want to believe that there's like a, a right way of making a drawing and like they don't want to do it poorly. And so like using references is like, or like doing studies, it can be a way in which people try to like kind of permanently escape. Um, doing things the wrong way. And so like they they like try to train to be good enough to be able to draw from imagination. I think people drawing from imagination and just sucking at it forever is like actually really productive. Um, it's just that like it's more productive to met like to like do a mixture of like studying and measuring your art against references while also drawing from imagination. And like, it seems like people tend to either go really hard towards one or the other. And like figuring out a productive mix of the two is the thing I think I don't see a lot of. And that's like, that's what we definitely need more of is people like doing a productive mix of like studying art from reference and um, using reference for like their personal pieces, like for their imaginative work. And also just like trying to make stuff up from their imagination. Like the, the, if you can, if you can do those in like fairly equal measure, I think you're going to get better really fast. It's just that like, yeah, we tend to bias ourselves to like wanting to go really extreme on one end or the other. Okay. There's parts about this. I'm actually starting to like now. I'm like getting it out of that zone where I hate it, but like I, do not like the face. And I don't know if I want to redo the face or if I want to see if I can cheat it a little bit by like, <laughs> by like stylizing the rendering and being like, oh, actually it's like all blown out and like painted over. And it's like, you know, I lowered the contrast on it. <laughs> it just turned it into kind of like a, a big geometric shape that's like face-ish. And then I don't need to like, face the music that I like did a bad job on the face face the music I'm doing one study and then um, something for imagination and I run into something that I don't know I'll pull reference and complete from the imagination piece and then back to a study yeah I mean that's like a really good way of doing it that sounds like a really productive um, 
That sounds like a really, really productive attitude towards it. I would say it sounds like you're off to a pretty strong start. Put a bag on her head. <laughs> it's like, there's like, um, there's gotta be something like big that I fucked up. Like, it's just like, uh, I feel like the, the like little things are kind of all there. It's just like something big got screwed up early and I didn't catch it. And now it's just like, it's something about the glasses also. Like, I mean, maybe I've, I just do a little, like take it back a couple of steps and then I build it back up because I didn't spend that much time on it. And then I'm going to call it done because I'm uh, the when the AC went out the the when the power went out like my office started to get a lot hotter and I'm like dripping sweat in here. <laughs> I feel like it's just an unspoken thing that professionals use references and don't talk about it. Like I think the thing is, I've been around. I've seen a ton of re like professionals that all they do is yell at people that they're not using enough reference. And then like the kinds of people that like show up to like workshops and, and things, everyone's just constantly screaming about reference. And like the issue comes from people are being too slavish to reference and not using their imagination enough. So like there are pockets of culture where like reference is, is so reverent, people are so reverent towards reference that they like never actually get to the point where they're like learning how to draw because like they're just photographing their doughy ass selves and then tracing over it and so you see a lot of like <laughs> you see a lot of like speculative fantasy art where people are trying to get like jobs on like magic and D&D &D and stuff and you can tell it's just like some D&D &D fan like painting a suit of armor over themselves without any real respect for like the fantasy of it and like the imagination of it and it's like, oh, I did a perfect job with the reference. You know, why is nobody loving the fact that like, it just looks like a, a person in cosplay, a person in like weak cosplay. Like a, a semi good drawing of a person in cosplay is like not the kind, is not the fantasy we have. We want larger than life. We want big, bold expressions like for um, in the fantasy world. And like, we've kind of moved away from that because of people's like over excitement about reference, I think. All the old masters used reference in live models and said, yeah, absolutely. Like, I, I don't think that that's that forgotten. I, I mean, but maybe it's like, depending on what corner of the internet you're on, it's different. Because like, there are that probably in like the anime spaces, like if, if it's just like different kinds of um, subcultures you're in, you're going to end up seeing very, very different uh, attitudes towards these sorts of things. Honestly, like over the last several years, I wish I had seen less pieces that were heavily referenced. People, they want to be, they don't want to look dumb. And so they like avoid using their imagination and they avoid taking big swings at like wild ideas. Ooh, I think I might be getting summoned. I think my workmen might be done with their pro week long project. Koei has a great question uh, uh, asked about you moved from when you moved from traditional to digital. Oh, uh, I didn't ever move from traditional to digital. I started digital. But like I always started digital with a love for the look of traditional artwork. And so I, you know, I developed working techniques that were in line with um, traditional artists. And, um, and that like led people to be confused about whether or not my work was digital or traditional. And uh, I was always a little bit flattered by that because I always felt like 
you know, uh, I love these kinds of like classical painting techniques. And yet, like, you know, I haven't actually practiced them too much. I find a lot of people have it uh, as a point of pride that can redraw something without reference, but then they are stuck only drawing the same things over and over again because they can only draw what they know. No. I mean, that's kind of me. <laughs> um, I, I really always try to resist learning to um, draw new things. Like right now I have a painting where I'm supposed to be like drawing like a, um, an angel with a, a, a chariot being drawn by sphinxes. And so I have to draw like lion bodies and I just have absolutely no idea how to do it. And I'm just like desperate. My, my, I, I need to do it with, uh, I need to draw these sphinxes cause it's like for a tarot deck and like the card is supposed to have sphinxes on it. But uh, I would love to come up with a solution that doesn't like force me to have to learn how to draw lions cause I don't have any experience with drawing lions and they're kind of central to the piece. So if I do a bad job drawing the lions, I've made a bad piece of art and so I feel like the stakes are kind of annoyingly high. Uh, yeah, Sphinx Chariot, it's a cool idea. It's like, it's a classic piece of symbolism on the chariot card in tarot, is uh, a chariot being drawn by a black and a white Sphinx. I hate this face less. Yeah, less. It's simpler. Okay. And I'm going to call it. Even with the blackout, it's kind of. Yeah, it's a. I can show you guys what I've been working on before I fully log out here. Let me just save up my file real quick. Huckleberry Studies. Number 61. Frustrating one. Mm -hmm. So this is the second to last tarot card that I haven't touched yet. I've had to look up so much reference for lions and stuff for this. Uh, so yeah, here's my, here's my color rough for the, uh, if there's, so you can't actually see a chariot in the, um, Rider weight deck. There's like a, like there, it's like the guy standing in like a little house. It's like a guy in armor standing inside a little house with two sphinxes sitting in front of it. And so I was like, okay, well, I don't want to, I'm not sure I'm going to do one black sphinx and one white sphinx. I might still um but i mostly just want them to not look embarrassingly bad and i need to get like some of the compositional elements balanced out i might need to have some more support stuff to make it feel a little bit more like there's some platform or something that constitutes a chariot um but i'm perfectly happy with just sort of posing the angel like he's riding a chariot and then having the sphinxes out front like i think that by doing a more minimalistic approach to it. I potentially have the ability to like sell the concept of the chariot without actually showing a chariot. And then I want a really like energetic explosion of clouds sort of expressing the idea of like motion and speed and stuff, which uh, that's gonna be the easy part. It's like drawing running, lions running in space. That is like the thing, lions running through thin air is like, the part where I'm really iffy on it because I do not have a good sense for cat anatomy. I mean, <laughs> um, uh, the uh, weight, the artist of the of this deck clearly didn't have a ton of, of like, wasn't exactly doing perfect cat anatomy either. Um, but it's like uh, this more iconic art sometimes survives on the sort of iconic representations of things. But for my style, I don't think I can pull that off. <laughs> uh, I don't. I also don't think I'm going to be putting breasts on the on these sphinxes. I think. Uh, well, it's a kind of a classic mythological depiction. I don't know. Maybe I should. Maybe I should throw some boobies up on these on these uh, wild sphinxes here. 
I also thought I threw some eyeballs on him. Oh, I did. There we go. The layers are just turned off. So I had a little gradient map and some eyeballs on it last minute before I like logged out last night. I was working on this at like 10 o'clock at night, which is not the greatest time to be working on art. It's all so much rougher than it should be at this stage that it's like it's <laughs> it's lining itself up to be a real pain in the ass because like it as it stands like I have a lot of little and big problems that all need to get solved before I can start pinning things down but I'm trying to still figure it out as this like big mushy pile of like value and color um and if I have like Doing all that rough is fine so long as I have like a firm structure to tie it all down to when I go to like do the details. But like I can't do the details without actually having a real firm structure I'm going to be like attaching them to at the end. And so me never quite getting a solid drawing for this thing um, means that I'm like really running like I'm, I'm really doing this in a risky way that has the potential of backfiring on me so uh, it could be a real bummer uh, to try to finish but um, I've got it started pretty early in the month I'm supposed to finish it by the end of September and so uh, you know I'm gonna be poking at it I think every couple of days and seeing if I can get myself out of this like kind of creative debt that I built up uh, wife is here what's up wife um, they're going to be working on a thing in the kitchen and I have to leave now. So if you need me to pay them right. or anything, I'm not going to be here. All right. So I'm, gonna, I'm wrapping up right now anyways. Okay. okay. Great. Um, I did, I did see the mummies up close though <laughs> in those glass boxes. Yeah. 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 Um, the buoys to distract the questionable anatomy for sure. Uh, yeah, if you really want to like let, have people stop looking at like uh, your anatomy critically, just throw some uh, just throw some booba in front of it and like uh, you know just distract them. It's a real option. Are these new angels or are, uh, uh, you have attributed to tarot archetypes? No, I'm I decided to sort of cast my existing angels into the different tarot archetypes because I have so many to choose from. I decided like to like pick them based off of a combination of whether or not I thought their physical traits matched the cards or like their thematic traits matched it. And um, I wonder if I would have been better off like designing all original angels specifically for the tarot, if that would have been more interesting. But I I don't know. I like I liked the idea of like this card is this angel and this card is this angel. And then I just am now so deep into the process that that's kind of it. And that's going to be true for the major arcana. For the minor arcana, I don't see myself like casting angels into each of those. I think I'm probably going to be doing something that's either a little bit more abstract and freeform or something, or I'll be making some like all like 54 new original angels. All right, rage candidate. Uh, we got uh, Luda P. It looks like it's going to be the raid target for today. Uh, so I'm going to add that here. I keep hearing this whistling sound coming from somebody. I think it's got to be Steve because uh, everybody else is muted. Um, chat. Sorry okay. about that. Oh, no problem. I'm just slightly confused. You can hear like just a little bit of a sound coming in here and there. All right. So this we're going to my fan. raid uh, Luda P. Thanks everyone for joining me today. Uh, it's always fun to hang out and work even when I am struggling with my work. It's great to have company and uh, it's always nice to have you guys like hang out with me while I'm working. I'll be back again tomorrow at noon, uh, noon Eastern. And uh, in the meantime, I'll see you on the other side.